This is Felipe, Lake Feppard, Danaluz. My respect for this guy is off the charts, and that's where his game should be. He's the creator of the Spark the Electric Jester series, a trilogy of high-speed action platformers which draw inspiration from Sonic, Kirby, Metal Gear, Mega Man X, and more anime than I can shake a stick at. I have an adoration for each entry, with 3 being my favourite game of last year, and the most fun I've had with a 3D platformer in some time, it is seriously overlooked. And while I might not be able to get them on the charts, I can at least chart the growth of them and their creator. And to do that, we gotta begin in the before times. Lake actually got his start in Flash animation, influenced by Super Mario Bros. Z. Unfortunately, I can't show you any of his works from this time because he made these when he was a teenager and was lucky enough to be able to destroy them. I can relate. He swiftly swapped to a more macro media with fan games, releasing Sonic before the sequel in 2011, and with this Lake did as Sonic would and hit the ground running, before immediately got a lot of attention. And some fascinating connections are created in this period. Lake made free fan games using Sonic Worlds, an engine built on top of Click Team Fusion meant for simplifying the design process. This is the same base used for Freedom Planet, and a lot of the code for Sonic Worlds is by a guy called Damazine. A lot of the same names pop up here and there, and Damazine seems like a relatively little known figure outside of the scene who has contributed a ton to it over the years, helping with coding for 2D and 3D Sonic projects on top of his own work with Worlds. One of the early 3D fan engines even came from him carrying on a project started by Christian Whitehead years before he went on to do the ports and mania. The Sonic community is often the butt of jokes, but there are some real bright sparks in there, and it's cool seeing all these people coming up at around the same time from near enough the same starting point spurred on by passion, creating for fun, or just wanting a good game when the Sonic series wasn't giving them what they wanted. While Sonic Mania is the most famous thing to come out of this space, and I understand why, Freedom Planet and especially Spark deserve a look in. Though like any good Sonic title, we've got free acts to clear first. Sonic Before the Sequel is an okay first entry. It plays it fairly safe with only a few stages really gripping me, one of them being the Lost Level Zone, riffing on Sonic 2's storied cut content and interpreting how these stages might have played. But even this early on, we do see Lake iterating upon Sonic in small ways of his own, and many of these changes do hold water. He does a lot more with weather effects and lighting to make his stages more interesting to look at and give them a sense of progression. Gameplay-wise, he tackles unpopular, contentious, or awkward mechanics and tries to fine-tune them to better fit his idea of Sonic's gameplay. See his take on the Slicer, a hated enemy in 2, here he has kept their attack pattern an essential character while making them far less unfair. They're not in bad nick. I also enjoy how it swaps characters between each zone. There's novelty in that this may be the first time I've played stages tailored for Tails. And speaking of Tails, as its name suggests, it takes place between Sonics 1 and 2 and tells the story of how these two met. Lake used his experience of animation to add cutscenes, which being Flash cause hell nowadays. I played on an updated version not made by Lake, which attempted to reanimate these in Click Team Fusion. I wasn't aware of this until it was pointed out to me, so I assumed he just got really good by the sequel. And unless you got Flash, you're gonna have to watch the real deal re-uploaded elsewhere, crystallized like one third of the lost levels. Rough in spots, but very charming. The remake does at least capture the tone well, lighthearted with a dash of slapstick. Lake makes great use of what sprites he has to work with to convey a simple yet expressive story with no dialogue. It got a few smiles out of me. Before the sequel wound up impressing a guy named Falcao Young, who contacted Lake about composing an original score for Before. Lake was down, so a team was put together, and in 2012, it was re-released with an OST that even got Jun Sanyu's attention. Many of these names have gone on to pretty big projects, and most relevantly to this, Bulk went on to do the mastering for Mania. I, for the most part, like the music. A few tracks are a little clunky, and Sunset Star Act 2 may be the oddest composition I've ever heard for a Sonic stage. They got some brass balls, haven't they? Sonic After the Sequel followed in June 2013, and unlike Blast, is a blast to play through. Taking heavy inspiration from Heroes, though we won't hold that against it, basically every zone is trying out something a little different, and I love the way these levels flow. They're more gimmick and obstacle heavy than traditional 2D Sonic, with mastery over the current gimmick being the way to hidden goods in higher routes. Sonic's movement is still important, but de-emphasized because of this, so if you're a bit of a purist, this may not gel with you. Stages can get a little repetitive, but tended to end just as I felt an obstacle had run its course. Though perhaps my favorite idea was one of its simplest, coming in Sugar Splash Zone Act 3. 
Every once in a while, water will rush through the level, disrupting jumps and throwing you into hazards. First time around, I hated this, but on a revisit I learned to jump in time with the flooding to get me out of jams into higher ground. This is Sink or Swim, a deceptively clever obstacle that a skilled player can turn to their advantage. Blake is also iterating rapidly in his own ways, he's putting way more of his own art into the mix. His own badniks are well designed with sharp timing and clear, readable tells. He's further experimenting with telling story through level design. I love Tails flying the tornado in the background of the opening act, set to KGZ's The Adventure Continues. It's such an exciting way to kick things off. It has so much confidence and time and again after the sequel proves itself worthy of this opening bombast. And in this track, the hero's influence is made clear with Seaside Hill riffs. And on that note, the music has also drastically improved, better matching the ebb and flow of stages and better matching sonic music, while still letting the artists maintain their own identity and tackle an eclectic mix of genres. I would thoroughly recommend giving After the Sequel a go if you're into Sonic, though part of what's so interesting about it is that it's very much a collage. Many gimmicks and elements are taken from other platformers and made to work well with Sonic, though it is buggy. If you think you'll actually be After, you might want to hold your breath. Besides the fact I couldn't get cutscenes working on this one period, which is a shame because much like everything else they've come on leaps and bounds, I had a glitch where I kept drowning during the penultimate battle as Super Sonic. It's such a shame because the credit zone looks really charming. As you make your way through, you're treated to zone trivia delivered by Lake and the music team, listing their intentions and influences, which is a really charming peek behind the curtain. Lastly, we have Sonic Chrono Adventure. Now, I'm not a fan of Metroidvanias, but that's okay, because this is actually a Metronic game. Which it turns out, I'm also not so hot on. This is Lake's most story-oriented work so far, and it's disorienting. The plot is simple yet slapdash and confusingly told. It's as if Sonic is chasing after the plot and only getting the tail end of it. Not to mention that guy is nowhere to be seen. It's also my least favourite to play, the stage is roughly as flat as the narrative, and the gimmicks don't escalate so much as they just repeat. The Metronic style abilities are fun to toy with but cumbersome to use. There is cute sprite work and Lake is making further stabs at reimagining what 2D Sonic can do, but not even the boost can turn this into a rush. All of the music is reused or sampled from elsewhere, though this is where my criticism has to end because there's a reason for all of this. Chrono Adventure came out just six months after, um, after the sequel, and Lake started working on Chrono because he made After in 10 months and the music team couldn't keep up with him. Oh, and Chrono was an expansion for a demo he made. During this time, Lake is also drawing up prototypes of Spark while still a game design student. Sonic 1 was born out of an ideal that players would speedrun it. Well, it seems like Lake took that attitude to game making. And all the more impressive is how much he develops between titles in every sense of the word. Before the sequel is iterative, while there are some original ideas, it is for the most part playing with what's in the toy box and only layering on things here and there. There's a reason Lost Level Zone stuck out to me. It is a fun level on its own merits, but a good deal of joy came from being in on the bit. Lake was very sharp about this. He knew he didn't yet have much to work with in terms of skill, so his method of getting eyes on his work came in the framing, setting a game between one and two as a means to get people interested, while also letting him start in familiar territory come after the sequel and he starts sharpening up his own level design and starts adding elements not seen in the Sonic series along with more of his own assets. Fan service is no longer top priority, still not wholly original, but undeniably more experimental. This game feels like Lake fully turning over every mechanic and examining them from all angles so that he knows better how to use them later. Chrono adds entire new features on top of the classic formula. Health bars, shops, inventory, an overworld, and abilities, some of which modify the controls and physics. Now instead of threading story between games and tying them to canon, Lake is adding his own characters and world building, along with dialogue. While I don't care for Chrono's design, I do respect it. Stages had to be built to be navigable in both directions. Lake had put upon himself a whole new set of difficulties and very quickly adapted to match them, even adding a helper character in somewhat graceful fashion. I would also argue that if you are new to Sonic games, Chrono's relatively low difficulty, health point system, and more relaxed pace with player-driven exploration makes for an okay starting point. It's amazing how much more expansive the guy gets with each and every entry, never resting on his laurels, always willing to throw something new into the Mega Mix. I'd even posit these games are a prime argument for the value of fan works as a learning tool. While fan games tend to not get as much flack, I'd say we tend to look down on fan works. 
I'm guilty of that too, and I'll continue to be every day I see a Danganronpa project on Casting Call Club, especially when they don't take me on. But there's nothing wrong with using fan works to learn a craft. Writers can learn using established voices. Fan animations, films, and art can draw on iconography. Fan games have a base of character abilities and general design. In all these cases, you can learn by seeing and reinterpreting how these things work and then develop your own style and approach. When Lake made before the sequel, he had zero programming skills of his own. He made what he could with the tools and expertise he had, and in so doing learned he wanted to make games for a living. So he grew and adapted with a base to build from, helped by a community of people around him which further allowed him to expand his skill set. And especially with free fan games, you get to go wild and try things the real license holders might balk at, like a Metronic game. With each entry, we see Lake step out of Sonic's shadow. Oh, um, he was also planning a Shadow Cross Kill the Kill fan game, which he canned. Maybe this is why people take the mick out of fan stuff. I say, looking at something that was no doubt being made with a wink and a smile. The Spark for Spark first came about during After the Sequel, with a Kirby-inspired power-up which gave Sonic a new move. Blake wondered what a character based around this mashup would really entail, and he mocked up a few designs but could never quite find something others would like. Funnily enough, it wasn't until Andy Tunstall, one of the musicians who worked with Lake, reworked his earliest draft that the design clicked. Lake put it that he had it right on the first try. It just needed to be refined by a better artist. A sort of return to for me. I'll be referring to this art book here and there, and this whole thing is hosted on Imager. It's funny how with such a simple character design, it can swing so wildly. I find this one adorable, but the expressions are really hit and miss. This one worries me. I feel like Spark has just learned about crypto and is about to put his powers to the worst use possible. I've talked with friends who are way more artistically minded than me and they find Spark's character design too flat and simplistic. I think it works great in motion, what with the scarf and jester hat, but I am rather easy to please. With the title's emphasis on transformations, it also serves as a simple base to modify. The Sonic, Kirby, and Rystar influences are clear while the final character still has at least a little bit of a look of his own. And Spark's character portraits in the game itself are consistently charming. Luckily he got off the blockchain in time for these. Lake spent a year refining a demo and laying the groundwork in development before launching a Kickstarter in 2015, billing Spark as a mix of Mega Man X, Sonic, and Kirby Superstar. That's a fun pack. While funding was crucial to development, the Kickstarter was largely ran so Lake could pay his music team this time around, so he seems like a sound guy. Unlike his Sonic games, Spark took a while. Originally slated for a 2016 release, which slipped into 2017. I don't mean this as a slight. This was a commercial release, the scope of the project far larger, and this was now an original IP. And of course the extra time and polish really shows. That said, it had a rough start. The game was made on XP and had a lot of technical issues for people on more modern systems, and while patched up, it remains patchy for players even to this day. Not to mention, there weren't many players to begin with. Lake mentions how one issue with moving away from fan games is that unless you have a really distinctive style for people to latch onto, very little of your old audience will follow. I and many others only came to learn that Spark 1 existed because Spark 2 made the rounds by being an adventure-ish platformer. And I'll admit, the only reason I played Spark 1 was to get to 2. I went in expecting not much more than a novelty, but I'm ecstatic that I did. And that's because Spark 1 became what may be my favorite 2D platformer. We begin with Spark telling us his bizarre life story. He studied electrical engineering at university, and in his spare time made a jester hat which allows him to manipulate electricity with his fingers. Upon graduating, he learned that electricians had been replaced by robots. What a tragedy. Luckily, he's a man of many hats. And with his, he became a street performer before getting picked up by the circus. Only for a robot replica of him to steal his job before his first paycheck. Unable to afford rent, Spark is worried. Don't worry, Spark. After the last video, we're all concerned by this setup. But no need to fret. Spark may be out of a job, but this intro really works. It's such a jam-packed series of coincidences and contrivances to explain Spark's abilities and situation. An electrician suffering robo-redundancy who's athletic enough to join the circus, who had built a powerful jester hat which let him toy with electricity. It's a hell of an arc. Even the title is bizarre. The only other time I think you'd even see the words Spark the Electric Jester strung together is a party clown getting the electric chair. It all comes across like a tongue-in-cheek take on mascot platformers in a typically contrived construction by taking it to an extreme. 
It's silly, but then played totally straight, and the rest of the game has the conviction to carry this off. By the end, I'm totally invested in this bizarre setup carried purely on the sheer sense of fun and excitement it all leads to. It pokes fun at the absurdity of this kind of game, but also gets why it's done and why it's fun. As a name, Spark the Electric Jester even comes across as a fairly succinct riff on the Ringmaster. Sonic is often portrayed as a drifter, never staying in one place for too long. Spark drifts between jobs, though a lot less willingly. Sonic is associated with wind, Spark with electricity. Both are names and motifs which suggest speed. And obviously to cap this all off, we got a robot doppelganger, which for now will be played for gags. This is all very playful, so let's get to playing. Spark spots some robots going rampant, and with nothing better to do, our recently sacked star springs into action. And we're off. Stage 1 hits us out of the gate with green grass and rolling hills, set to a Mega Drive base so thick that the genesis of this game seems unmistakable. But if you're expecting Spark to play just like Sonic, you're in for a shock. The first few seconds of control are a very deft little demonstration of its differences. Two short jumps to get a feel for the gravity, then two health capsules because instead of rings, we got a health system and this shows us what to look for. Rings have been replaced by bits. These very slowly fill up a bar which gives you a free revive. It's a neat replacement for the live system, keeping some of the tension and providing exciting second wins. Spark is a tough game, but between this, infinite lives otherwise, and constant checkpoints, it's also rather forgiving. This leads into a small speed segment to demonstrate that momentum is still a factor. The first enemy then is placed in a way where you need to confront it. Spark is a far more mechanically complex game than Sonic, with a far greater focus on combat. Most enemies don't deal contact damage, instead you and foes need to actively attack. I have to give props not only for the sheer amount of enemies in this game, but for how well done they are. There's just one enemy in the whole game who felt unfair to fight and they're on the last level. For the most part, they put up an enjoyable scrap before becoming such, with good tells, surprisingly varied movesets, and new arrivals level by level. Spark himself is no slouch either. Besides normal attacks, he has air attacks, directional attacks, charge attacks, and by filling the static meter, you can unleash devastating supers. And what with needing to hold down the attack, there is a little bit of tension to it, like you're carrying this big attack to where you need it. Beyond that first foe, the path diverts. And this is where Spark also diverts from Sonic, in that navigating through levels is less about movement and more about move set. Spark has wall jumps for added vertical mobility, and instead of a spin dash we got a... a dash. But there's still a spin to it. The dash is a good way to quickly get speed from a standstill, instantly change direction, and can be used to run up inclines. So far so straightforward, but it does have a knack to it. There are situations, especially downslopes, where it can be used to get a ton of acceleration, but maintaining speed is about skillfully navigating the environment without it, as it will bring you back to a set speed. You have to be careful when and where you use it if you want to keep up the pace. I can sum up the controls and physics like this. Spark is more complex, but less nuanced than Sonic. He's more complex in that he's got way more of a toolkit of moves to learn, and those moves have subtleties which make their use satisfying or let you get a bit more juice out of them. But he's far less nuanced than Sonic in that Sonic is very much about learning how to get the most out of the few moves he has using the environment. Spark allows the player to brute force where they want to go where Sonic would need to finesse a jump. Momentum still does help a player get an edge, or an edgy as we'll soon see, but only occasionally. It's like the foundational physics this game are built on top of are almost vestigial. So if you're all about that classic momentum-based platforming, you're not going to get everything you're after. And I should say, I'm not bringing up these differences as a criticism of one or the other. I'm going to be doing a few more Sonic comparisons as this video goes along, as the influence does remain, and there are some interesting similarities and divergences. But I also want to point out now that we're here, I don't think you need to be a fan of Sonic or Kirby or Mega Man to enjoy Spark. It has enough going for it to stand alone. Spotting the influences is just a fun bonus if you're also a fan of those series. I will also say that being a Sonic fan who hasn't put his time in with Mega Man or Kirby, I can't spot those references and can only come at this series from a Sonic lens, which is a bit of a disservice to it. I'll link to a vod of a mate of mine who's played way more games and can spot those references. Anyway, on our way out of the first area, look who drops in. The two have a bizarre little back and forth, insults are thrown, the hero's short fuse is blown, and he decides that robot apocalypse or not, his only goal in life now is sparking this guy out. It's good to have a direction in life. And being a Sonic-esque game, that's the right direction. This brings us to the Network Coast. This level is an early game favourite, it's amazing. It's almost a 2D metal harbour with a great balance of speed and water sections, 
the music is energetic, the background is gorgeous, and there are robot pirates. We've talked Sonic, so now let's tackle the Kirby influence. Spark's abilities are anything but static. The guy's a transformer. Dotted throughout the stage and occasionally hidden away are Jester powers. You carry two at a time and they can only be lost if knocked out of you or dropped. And these things are no laughing matter. They may not even be matter. More than just power-ups or suits with some extra abilities, many of these feel like totally distinct playable characters. I'd even argue a good number of them could carry games by themselves. Some have air dashes, some double jump, some have up and down moves, some have light combo systems, some have ammo. They all have different attacks and some completely mix up the charge mechanic, like when filled they give you a movement boost, infinite ammo, or a shield. Some change how you interact with water. Yeah, this is why Network Coast is a great balance of speed and water sections. Bored of the water? Bored on the water. This game gets it. And it doesn't end there. Edgy lets you run up walls. Wind completely changes your physics. There's also cute stuff like them having unique animations for looking up and down and so on. There's just so much here and it's of such good quality. Now, this does come with what could be called a downside. Spark is a jester, not a tightrope walker. Balance hardly feels like it was even a consideration. Sure, some are more tuned for platforming and others bosses, some give you ranged options at the cost of mobility or vice versa, but there are also clear best options. Hey, what do you think would be the boss killer? Fire powers? A magic wand? How about a simple electric bat? Yeah, no wonder robots took over the job market. The people here can't even spell. Still, this thing is the strongest power bar none. You just jump, spin, and everything's dead. Meanwhile, Wind and to a lesser extent Edgy just blow out the platforming sections and can more than hold their own in boss fights. Spark gets hard as it goes along, but if you grab Wind and Bat, which are basically the first powers you come across, they'll take you as far as you need to go. I mean, look at this. I can ignore platforming if I so choose. Meanwhile, Gravity brings new meaning to let Sparks fly, though this is balanced out by being unbelievably boring to use. An unconventional approach to nerfing, but one which works really well on me. And this brings us to something I skillfully avoided earlier. The dash isn't just a dash. It's also a dodge. If you've watched me for a while, you know I love cool dodges, and this one's a winner. Its timing and effects both lend to it feeling endlessly rewarding to pull off. And it's forgiving enough to get a grip on, but it's tight enough not to trivialize stages. And it's sick how you have to dodge into things. It's such a cocky move. It makes a lot of the enemies and bosses far more fun to fight, lets you pull risky moves to style through the stage, and on the harder modes, mastering it is more or less a necessity. I do have a couple of gripes, though the first one is pretty much in line with the game's irreverent tone. You're only told about the dodge mechanic in a cutscene before the hard mode. Aren't you a cheeky little bugger? Secondly, it makes any jester power which lacks an air dash feel incredibly restrictive. No amount of power quite compares with the ability to dodge at any time. As the game goes on, the stronger powers do seem to get trickier to come across, and this is good and bad. Good because it makes them more valuable, and losing them more daunting and tense. Bad because the only way to lose them is to trade them off or have them knocked out of you, which is rare. It can discourage experimentation, as it could be a long while before you get your favourite back again. There are only a couple of powers I dislike, and I tend to play with a self-imposed rule to swap out as often as I can to vary up a playthrough and keep things fresh, but play as you like. For a player who's struggling, who needs those stronger powers, it can be a real kick in the teeth to lose them, and it can discourage swapping out to try something different if you feel you're dependent on it. I bring these issues up because I know they exist, but the game gets around them by having all but a couple of powers be really fun to use. And even in those powers I don't like, there is none of Chrono's clunkiness. Everything is smooth, and everything is workable. I just adore the powers in this game. I love how stuffed each of them are, so unbalanced yet never falling on their face, each more or less a full character. Another thing that goes a long way in making them all feel so complete is in how so many of them have little tricks and subtleties which are completely surplus to requirement. Some I didn't pick up on for a good few playthroughs, or only learned when I saw friends use them. Now you can pause the game and read the hints, but that comes with risks. Like how Fire Jester gains a dash attack. The hoverboard's attack gives some air. Wind makes you so light your heavy attacks have recoil. Fire doesn't fully work underwater. Arrow's down attack can double as a way to extend jumps. There's so many little touches and easter eggs and my head is spinning. My favourite little trick belongs to Hammer. 
The down attack creates debris, which can be swatted to give it a ranged attack. These are way better than the swords. And speaking of blue balls, there was meant to be a cutscene in this stage explaining that despite there being a global robot rampage, these robot pirates have nothing to do with that. They're just doing what robot pirates do. I choose to believe that's still canon. The network coast takes us from one shore to another, and we enter the Smog City sewers. The following three levels form a trilogy of sorts, from sewers to skyscrapers. First we traverse up from the trash burning sewers, defeating its samurai robot. You are right, Spark. From there we tackle the smog filled lower city, then up into the corporate sunset heights high above the pollution. This sequence is a treat visually and musically and the progression between them is so smooth. The sewer track is mysterious and pondering, perfect for puzzling your way through the place. Smog City is energetic and lively, the bustling lower section of a metropolis. The music once again slows down as we climb free of the fumes, letting us breathe a little easier in Sunset Heights with a killer track from Funk Fiction. I love how these three stages swap to a more vertical focus to tie them all together. It follows Spark as he chases his lookalike to the top of the city. Or well, it's meant to feel like that. I'm kinda just going with the flow here. The gameplay also lowers its tempo as we go back into more platform heavy challenges. Up until near endgame, Spark tends to follow this rhythm of alternating calm track to exciting track, which does help keep the game from feeling stagnant. But I do find the level design itself to be one of the relatively weaker elements, especially in the first half. With stages feeling segmented and over long, many taking 8 to 10 minutes to clear. While levels do feel different enough in their individual elements and general navigation, they follow a beat by beat layout where the game snaps between speed, platforming, gimmick, and combat areas. It particularly hurts speed sections, as at their worst they wind up feeling like set pieces or cutscenes with minimal interactivity, the game reminding you that speed exists, getting you good and wired, and then grinding to a halt as it changes focus. Where Sonic would let you often use speed to trick your way into another area, here they're too often just bridges between different challenges, with perhaps one or two jumps to change lanes. The speed all too often lacks its own function, which makes it feel perfunctory. I will say that the game massively improves in the back half with stages getting more daring and mixing elements more and more. But Spark is a decently long 2D platformer at 4 to 5 hours. It's unfortunate that a game with so much running takes so long to find its stride. This wasn't really an issue the first time I played. In fact, it worked to the game's benefit. The first half let me really toy around and play with powers. Then in the back half, it felt like I was being tested on all that I had learned. But on repeat playthroughs, the first leg of the game can make me feel impatient. Like I'm waiting to get to the fireworks factory. The level design sits somewhere between After and Chrono, but tragically this is an element that doesn't really feel like a next step or a big advancement. It's not as compact as After and in my opinion nowhere near as interesting or experimental, but it's also nowhere near as flat as Chrono, perhaps saved by the fact that Spark works far better with these kind of flat grounds, which feel like a waste when Sonic is there because Sonic literally needs stuff to bounce off of. The approach to gimmicks is different, but also feels distinctly between the two. There are bespoke level gimmicks, but they lack the presence from After and it's a lot of the same kind of gimmick. These tend to give Spark greater upward mobility, and all that changes is the means by which you manipulate it. What's actually more interesting are the obstacles not tied to specific stages, though this is another thing which makes Spark take a while to really take off. These are introduced slowly, seemingly one per stage from level 7 onwards. At their best, the stages mix tons of elements into fun challenges the player has a variety of ways to overcome through the Jester powers, with stage hazards adding complications to combat, speed letting a player smoothly bypass bots, and gimmicks rewarding an attentive and skilled player with goodies and new routes. It's cool, but another thing which leads to Spark feeling more than a little bit backloaded. Though speaking of routes, at times navigating to higher paths is dependent on having certain powers, with lower mobility jesters often completely locked out. This is an element of balancing that actually functions. It may seem odd, but I'm in favour of this. 
It makes the mobility feel more meaningful, reminds me a little of Sonic 3 and K, and it's especially satisfying if you can finagle your way up with something you clearly shouldn't be able to. Overall, the stages are mostly fine. I wish a few were chopped down by a couple of minutes in length and did more mixing of their elements early on, but it picks up as it goes. And it's worth praising that they don't fall apart or feel completely overshadowed given the variety of jester powers they all have to accommodate. At the top of the city, Spark once again comes face to face with his fake. This time, rather than taunting Spark, he instead begs him to go home, that this isn't his job. It's a pretty different tact from last time. Spark doesn't get it. I do really like the dialogue here, with Spark in over his head but not even caring. He doesn't stand down, a fight ensues, and Spark hijacks a transport to continue his pursuit. Before Crash Landing, he settles on a name for his robot double. Oh, your eye didn't like the joke there, Spark. And we're dropped in Lytoria Bay, a hologram-based amusement park. This level gives me pretty big Sonic CD vibes, and despite any gripes I just shared, this game still has way better level design than CD. Actually, this is where the upswing in level design quality begins. It also has my favorite enemy in the game. The security here will put a smile on your face and a hole in your chest. And because it reminds me of CD, let's talk about the music. I mean, you've been hearing it. This whole soundtrack is a winner. Before and after were both amazing, but listening back after Spark, they somehow feel stifled by their attachment to Sonic. With a fresh new world in which to flex their muscles, they've made such a strong set list. I heard it best described as a homage that's unique in an interview with Falk, which is a pretty good summation of Spark in general. Every stage track not only perfectly fits its environment, the music adds a genuine sense of depth and character to the stages. The eclecticism makes Spark's world feel alive and exciting. To top it off, I complain that the stages often outstayed their welcome, but the music never did. It's incredible too considering the number of musicians involved in such a relatively small scale project that the end result is not only so well done, but feels so cohesive. The sonic influences fell early on, then it diverts and starts fleshing out a new world. Where the earlier soundtracks referenced riffs from official Sonic games, now references to their work on before and after are slotted in here. It's a fun celebration of what got them to this point, while being worth celebrating in its own right. At the other end of the park, we run into its mascot, the holographic jester robot Romolo. Okay, actually we ran into him earlier in Smog City. He pretended to steal our wallet, and for that jape, we're taking his life for real. This brings me to boss fights. Let's start with the most important thing. There are a ton of them, with a good number of stages featuring multiple mid-bosses and all but one ending with a climactic battle. This doesn't start all that positive. Up until Romolo, the battles are often so trivial I'm worried the bosses are running on energy saver mode. It's this little mascot with his interesting patterns and second phase that promises there's excitement to come. And it's with the following stage I want to point out what I really love about the bosses, and it's where the Mega Man influence is at its most prominent. We run afoul of the Forest Guardian Karana, and their moveset is clearly the Archer Jester we've been able to use up until this point. A good number of enemies and bosses are based off of Jester powers. To start with, it's a fun world building detail. Jester powers are things used for hobbies and work. It seems Spark isn't the only one out of a job thanks to this job lot of jobbers. Gameplay-wise, I love rival fights, and this creates a lot of them. Plus, it rewards the player's own knowledge, as barring a few attacks unique to the bosses, they tend to have a lot of the same moves the players do. Then the stage ends with this. This is where the boss fights really take off. From here, the standard of bosses is kept high, often rich in challenge and spectacle. This is where the foes go from jobbers to needing the player to put the work in. 
And it's really fun. Good patterns, satisfying to counter. It maintains some of the rhythm of Sonic bosses. Heavy on movement, waiting for openings to punish and allowing a daring player to take risks to get more hits in. While also leaving room for Spark's greater complexity, with good use of Jester powers and Mastery of the Dodge, letting a player really go all out. Boss defeated, our platform crash lands out in the desert, and Spark is confronted by the Forest Guardian. Only now, she isn't hostile, but Spark is less thrown by the sudden turn, and more struck by the question as to whether robots can have genders. Luckily he decides to think about that on his own time so we can start the second coolest level in the game. This is a speed stage. Built for the board, landmines to outrun, DK barrel set pieces and power fluid. It's a thrill ride through and through. So while I have this exciting footage to hold you hostage, it's time I tell you about the lore of Spark. Oh, I've been antsy to get to this. So Spark is actually a Formi, which is an interplanetary insect species and they fled their own home centuries ago due to some sort of crisis. There's a reason this place is called the Murray Desert, and that's because we're in the Sea of Tranquility. You may have noticed a strange planet during the stages taking place at night. That's Earth. This game takes place on the moon. Spark species have settled in our solar system. Terraforming, anti-terraforming, terraforming. They've done up the joint. So where's humanity? Well, we're playing Milky Way musical chairs because no one knows. Nor do we know the reason why we left. And as of now, no, the series has not gone into where we've gone. I actually don't care if it ever does. I wonder if the mines in this stage are ours. Planting mines on the moon seems like the sort of thing we'd do. I rather like this backstory. It's strange, but it does create a perfect little platformer reality. The moon setting is a fun reason for the lowered gravity, and what with the terraforming, it turns out there's some literal world building going on. One of my favourite details is there are company logos chiselled into the landscapes, and we can see signage for these companies when we head through Sunset Heights. There's an absolutely unnecessary level of cohesion for a platformer setting, and I find it really charming. The stages, while bizarrely laid out, all make some kind of internal sense and tell their own story of the world, with themes of industry, pollution, fear of automation, and most fittingly for a dev who got his start in fan games, an ongoing wind crisis. And that isn't just fluff, that's an oddly diegetic reason for a great many of the stage hazards. That big ring encircling the planet, that's actually for climate control. And while I'm on the topic of their industry, it took me way too long to notice that a unifying design element for many of the robots was that they had faces resembling a typical Formi. Well, their beta designs anyway, which is odd. It is still a nice little design flourish. I suppose it is natural to anthropomorphize. Back to the moon thing, what do Formies call the planet? Well, they don't have a name for it. Okay, actually, that's not quite right. The problem is, they have too many. Formies are born fully able to communicate, and so the concept of foreign languages is foreign to them. So when they unearthed all of our data and realized we had many names for the moon, they had no earthly idea what to call it. This is utter lunacy, and I love it. And while this is just me Sonic spitballing, I do wonder if it's riffing on the odd split between Sonic's world being either Mobius or Earth. It would be a weird joke to make. I don't even think Yes could make a more roundabout riff than that if they tried, but it's pretty fun to think about. And at the end of the level, we meet a very confused robot. He's the intended guardian of Megarath, a giant computer meant for production of high-quality robots. Upon hearing this, Spark puts together that that must be the source of the uprising, and it seems this robot will make a fine ally, but the news that Megarath was finished years earlier causes him to turn. Spark's cool with it, but I'm not sure he understands why they're upset. What follows is a very easy boss fight, and this is for a rather unique reason. As shortly after Spark's victory, we find our former foe in the clutches of Freon, begging for life. He's cruelly destroyed.
this scene does move the plot along by giving Spark an actual objective, which is good because he's been running blind for an entire day now, but this scene also serves a bizarre meta purpose. This robot is called the Prototype. His easy defeat and subsequent destruction by the villain is because he was the original final boss design, scrapped both developmentally and now literally, as Lake came to find him utterly unimposing, and used this moment to make fun of himself for such a lame design. That's a really fun gag. It's such a strange, humble, weird way to go about this. It's the kind of bit you only ever really get in a one-man band project. So, now that Spark finally has a goal, and I've covered a great many of the major topics, let's pick up the speed. The following level is Luna Base, a chance to relax after Moray Desert. No enemies, just pure platforming challenges that at least initially you can take at your own pace. I at first thought the somber music was because of the death of the prototype and to give this stage a more contemplative tone, but now knowing that this is a human installation and we're all gone, it's a rather melancholy place overall. It also does a lot with lava, playing more like a Sonic after the sequel stage, exploring a singular gimmick in full. This also caps off a fascination with remixing underwater mechanics which flowed through each of the earlier fan games. The level itself culminates with a series of timed under lava sections where special checkpoints grant Spark a temporary heat shield, a pulse pounding scenario in and of itself, the consequences for failure terrifying. I always feel an urge to speed through these as quick as I can, just intrinsically and extrinsically, and this does come with a benefit of carrying the shield into other platforming challenges. It's a good incentive and reward for speedy play, really lighting a fire under your ass, it's a clever segment overall. And then we surface in Caria Valley. This stage is stunning. Literally, what with the interplanetary flashbang going off in the distance. And because this is an area of outstanding unnatural beauty, they're building a shopping mall here. Naturally. Okay, Caria Valley is absurd. It's a tourist destination, a spaceport, and where the military is stationed. Yeah, when that mall is done, it's gonna make for a bizarre bazaar. One neat detail about this stage is how it has lava. It's a pretty minor obstacle, but it's cool how it ties itself to the previous stage like that, making them feel interconnected. And this brings me to the unique strengths of Spark 1 overall. This first title is heads and shoulders above its sequels in three respects. The Jester powers are at their best, I like the soundtrack by far the most, and we've gone into why, but this also ties into what I'm about to say. This game feels like a journey, and this is achieved by a Sonic freestyle flow between levels, the sense of place each location provides, and the outstanding use of background art and continued, slightly subtler use of weather effects. Courier Valley, for instance, grows more smoggy as we make our way towards the city and train station. A sandstorm starts raging in the desert, or the lights going out in Lytoria Bay. Network Coast is awesome. As you begin the stage, you can see the coast of FM City, the previous level, and as you make it near the end, Smog City starts creeping in in the distance. While I knock the level design being repetitive and overlong, the locales often develop and change as you progress. This keeps the levels from feeling like treadmills, and besides being nice and dynamic, is encouraging the player that they're on the right track. On a macro scale, there's things like the time of day consistently and believably changing level by level. And this brings me to the funniest part of the art book, this extract. As you may have been noticing, Spark has been moving northwards throughout his journey towards Megarath as evidenced by the fact you're always moving right while facing west, and you always see the sunset. No lake. I didn't notice that. I appreciate the detail, and I appreciate the unearned respect I'm getting. Well, despite my inattentiveness, Lake's visual storytelling is wonderfully done here, and contributes to the sense that we're on some big adventure through a setting brimming with possibility. Courier Valley transitions through several locales and ends with us boarding a military train and, well, here's the thing. The entire moon is one nation. There hasn't been a war for centuries, so the army has been wrecked by the robots. But that ain't gonna stop Spark, and we depart in Turbulence Plains, which actually has my favourite backdrop in the entire game. I'm a big fan, and so I don't just blow through this stage, it has one of my favourite level hazards, dodging trains, which again ties it back into the previous level. And we go through a military derelict on the way to the apex of this game's wind theme. The Raynal Complex which sees us navigate our way through the guts of a giant wind plant. This stage is every wind gimmick rocking you like a hurricane, a fast-paced puzzle stage where suction tubes and reaction times will decide your path, and as we reach the plateau, we get some of the toughest platforming so far as we have to start fighting the game's physics to progress. It's a great stage, and a bit of an equalizer, as even the stronger powers start feeling reined in by the challenges faced here. And this is followed by a stage that I'm not terribly fond of, the game's one dud perhaps. 
The Megarath computer generates so much heat that it has to be built in a cold region for cooling, and so we head into the snowy Sunfire Forest. It's literally a sequel to Lytoria. The music and visuals do continue to charm, I love the atmosphere, but it does feel out of place. Both because we've already done this gimmick, and a level this laid back and upbeat in theme so close to the end of the game does stick out a little awkwardly. Plus, while Lytoria Bay reminded me of Sonic CD for positive reasons, this time it's laden with pinball gimmicks and some fairly dry platforming. It's one of the weaker stages overall, though not without its merits. You could see it as one last chance to breathe before we fully embrace the endgame, and its ultimate challenge definitely suggests that. We come to the Tower of Eos, a boss rush laid out for Spark, but not by the villains. On its roof we face Romolo yet again, and when defeated, he apologizes for his past actions and takes Spark to see the Doctor. Transported to a room filled with former foes, Spark thinks it's a trap. But then, the ugliest thing I've ever seen gets on screen and gives us a big dollop of plot. This is Dr. Armstrong, the roboticist behind Megarath. Deciding it needed a guardian, he built the robot now calling itself Freon, who went rogue and kicked off the robot rebellion. He now sits in Megarath, accumulating power which Armstrong fears will soon be put to terrible use. I've gone very light on plot up until now, but that's because there really hasn't been much to speak of. It's mostly filled with Spark having strange conversations with robots, before a boss fight kicks off because their programming means they have to fight. Meanwhile, Fark starts off confrontational before revealing a genuine concern for Spark, urging him to back down, his earlier aggression merely an attempt at scaring him off for his own safety. There's an absurd nonchalance to the dialogue which I rather enjoy, carried by how likeable I find Spark. He's a bit of a moron. His mind wanders off on odd tangents. He laughs at his own jokes, is really stubborn in some regards, really laid back in others, and despite his circumstances, harbors no ill will towards robots besides Fark, which is a really endearing quality. He's friendly, thin-skinned, and thick-headed. Spark has a likable story, but it's not well told. Often meandering, and on my first couple of playthroughs, I would often forget why Spark is doing any of this. His vendetta against Fark and plans to counter the uprising are told to the audience, but so flatly that they hardly register. It's easy to just forget what's actually happening. Though the strangest thing about the story is that it wasn't always like this. It was completely rewritten in a patch, and it may be the oddest rewrite I've ever seen, because rather than adding clarity to the story, it does the opposite. The older version is much easier to follow. Spark's motivations are far more readily established and reinforced. He's often given direction so the player understands why they're going where they're going. The details of the world aren't just subtext, but text box text text. Each scene feels necessary to the plot and adds details to the ongoing conflict. It's not only easier to follow, but it tells the player more. But all of this comes with a strange trade-off. It's also a lot less likable. The dialogue is clunkier and the gags grating. Spark himself is a completely different character, much more intelligent, yet arrogant and standoffish. Rewritten Spark seems to barely understand the robot uprising. He just doesn't like it and springs into action out of some innate goodness, I suppose? And a grudge not against robot kind, but just the one who aped and japed him. All the while never thinking about the bigger picture and hardly seeming to grasp what's really happening. The older version comprehends the scope of what's going on and doubts there's any chance of stopping it. He just wants to spark Fark before all goes dark. Armstrong sicks him on Freon, yet Spark only agrees to go along with the plan if Fark is in the way. I find old Spark interesting, an obsessive cynic who only saves the day because it enables his petty revenge, doing pretty much everything else on a whim. But I prefer the rewritten dumb as brick Spark, empty headed instead of single minded. Both versions act before they think and I like that, impatience is a fun flaw for a speed freak. Anyway, why the rewrite? Well, it's because of Spark 2. The sequel is going to delve a lot deeper into the robot uprising, and many of its new reveals would contradict Spark 1. So upon release of the sequel, the story was… gutted, essentially. All of the same scenes exist, what story is there takes just as long to be told, but with a majority of plot details excised so it wouldn't be at odds with the sequel. The problem is that it doesn't offer new details or introduce a new angle. It just has no one question or explain what's going on, instead doing bizarre little skits along the way. For an example, before the rewrite, Fark was built by Armstrong to get close to Freom and take him out, but since he wasn't connected to the internet, the means by which Freom spread his virus, he was quickly found out. In the update, Fark's origins and goals are just left up in the air. 
Armstrong believes he was trying to take out Free Arm and failed, but doesn't even speculate why. This is so the sequel has a hook to swing from. It's a bit sloppy, and I can't think of any other game that has done something like this. Despite all of that, just on the back of its oddball charisma, and because the series is going somewhere with all of this, I prefer the rewrite. This is a case where I'll take daft and charming over competent yet obnoxious, though I wish there was more of a middle ground, as it does wind up making the origin of the series feel a lot like aimless filler. Anyway, back to current events. Fark tried to take out Freon, but lacked the jewels for it, and Armstrong tells Spark his actions have been criminal, which... whoops. What are they going to charge him with? Assault and battery? They'd have to take him to a circuit court. But Armstrong promises to take care of all the legal guff and offers Spark a job. He's so happy. And jobs are good and we have to take down Freon, and that begins with the best level in the game. Megarath Fleet. High above the surface, the military is locked in a losing battle with Freon's forces. Spark is dropped behind enemy lines to infiltrate and blow up three of the ships, each of them filled with hordes of enemies and harrowing hazards. It's an exhilarating premise and is executed perfectly. Who ordered an electrician? Across each ship, the challenge ratchets up as we take on boss fights, disable weapons, and overcome what feels like an army of automatons. I absolutely love every aspect of this level. Just thinking about it wakes me up. And that music. This track was composed by Fault. Lake's instruction was the very helpful do whatever you want. This worked fine, because it turns out what Falk wanted to do was make the most awesome track imaginable. Being a JRPG guy, he describes it as a final dungeon, only going at 200 kilometers an hour, and it contributes to the metric ton of fun we're having here. This stage also has something really, really funny in it. Or not, I don't know. In the distance, you can often see the next ship you'll be tackling, along with a raging space battle. Lake says he programmed it so the battle will play out organically, with ships getting destroyed and the sky gradually clearing. Only he set the health value so high, he doesn't actually know if this feature works. Not exactly ship shape, is it? It's a good thing this stage is brilliant, Lake. Otherwise I might stop and actually look instead of enjoying myself. This stage is rad. It overcomes every single level design issue I feel the game suffers from. While still segmented, it's done in a way that suits the environment and feels distinct. Challenges intermingle and thread through one another. Each ship swaps up elements while escalating the challenge, culminating with us confronting Fark, furious we're here and unflinching in his mission. What follows is an amazing fight, if an absolute cast iron bugger first time around, as you have no time to pick up on his tells. It gets really satisfying to figure him out, dodges blows and punish. It's a great test of skill no matter what powers you've brought. Powers which you are very likely to lose. It's awesome. It basically forces a rival fight organically. Or inorganically. And then... Phase 2. I mean, that's basically a bat. Fark knows what's OP. And I die. Or not. Perfect timing. Phase 3. I don't know how many ways to say this stage just puts a smile on my face. With Fark's defeat and the fleet defanged, we fall back to the surface and launch an assault on Megarath itself. While the scenario is less exciting and it lacks the bombast of the fleet, it's still a brilliant sequence and sufficiently daunting final stage. With the Red Earth hung in the background and gimmicks themselves taken from Death Egg, this final stage truly is cracked. An onslaught of relentless robots and disorienting dangers. The one badly made enemy in the game. If these are the robots Megarath will help create, I'm only happy to pull the plug. These final two stages make a brilliant capstone. Taking a good few lives on my first time through and challenging every skill I had learned. The final stage is so bafflingly overstuffed that it looks unfair, 
but is actually very doable, and the satisfaction of winning is well rewarded. We get a delightfully hammy scene with Freon, as he announces his plan to launch Megarath as a rocket into the planet's ring, killing all organic life on the surface. His line's taunting and dripping with evil. It's really indulgent. He takes off, and Spark bolts after him. A confrontation ensues on top of Megarath's outer shell. Spark fights Freon to a standstill, and sick to death of the Jester, he goes for the juggler. And it's then that we swap to Fark, and hey, he has unique moves. And all we do with him is move to the right, and he makes a last minute save. One final sequence, one last great use of background art. I just love everything about this. We fly up the side of Megarath as it leaves the atmosphere. Between the cutscenes and what's going on now, there's a crudeness to the presentation that does not get in the way of selling how hype what's going on is. This crudeness actually contributes to the feeling of boundless imagination that gives the game its charm, giving it an easier time getting right into a sense of childish glee as Spark flies off for one final showdown. This feeling holds into the final battle. It doesn't give Freon many new moves, nor increase the difficulty. If you beat his earlier form, now you get to do it again with an overpowered moveset. This makes for a tepid final boss, but pretty amazing victory lap, set to an amazing backdrop and a killer score. Lake excels at finales. I think, ironically, they most remind me of his earliest listed inspiration, Super Mario Bros. Z. It's a goofy Flash cartoon with a premise that seems impossible to take seriously, but if you move beyond that and buy into the spectacle, it will speak to whatever childish joy you have left. Throwing action figures at one another with no shame nor sense of an upper limit for how crazy things can get. His endings all have an energy that make everything that came before, no matter how good they were, no matter how crazy or extreme, feel like Lake was holding himself back all along. And now the dam has burst and everything turns up to 11. And with Freon defeated and Spark now employed, he cleans his clock and clocks off. I've gone through this sequence time and time again, and it never fails to perk me up. From the amateurish yet expressive cutscene, the comedically over-the-top size of the beam, the moment of calm, then the absolute whiplash of the music, with a lineup of all the enemies in the game, it's so humble an ending. As between the enemy lineup, we see Spark returning to Earth. And that's the game. I got it expecting a novelty, and got japed into playing one of the sickest titles of all time. And we're still not quite done yet. This game is rather stuffed. Fark's story opens a month later, with Spark absent and Fark crashing at his place. He's bitter that he failed to carry out the purpose he was built for, but with the robot still rampaging, Fark knows that Freon is still out there somewhere, and sets off to put a stop to him. It's a rather light setup, getting the player back into the action as quickly as possible. Fark himself is a joy to play, no jester powers, but with far more bells and widgets than Spark. Unique attack strings, 
finishes charged by a free hit combo, air dashes, wall running, he's a dynamo. A mixture of various jester powers to form a singular, complex, and complete character. But his own unique power is the most enjoyable. Instead of a dodge, he gets a parry. It's a really meaty mechanic. Depending on how well your timing goes, it can merely deflect damage, deflect and grant some static, or deflect, grant static, and an opening. And this parry doesn't mess around. Enemy attacks, twat. Fan blades, hot air. Trains, on strike. Robot mind virus, McAfee. This is how you build static. Fark has less health, but when you fill half a bar, it can be traded for a heal and a temporary power up. Hold on to this until full charge and boom, Fupa Fark. This should be rewarding, and it can be, but god is static easy to build and exploitable thanks to stage hazards. This is meant to be the harder route, at least it comes across that way, but with a little patience it's almost trivial. The remix levels and Fark's somewhat unique abilities do make for a fun playthrough, one that I'm unsure if I enjoy more than playing as Spark himself. It goes to show the game isn't dependent on variety of movesets to be worthwhile, it remains fun even as a set challenge. It's the exact same set of levels, only with tougher enemies and some new routes Fark is funneled down. Lakers even remixed some of the bosses and added new ones. And um, I think it's fair to say the tone is different. Story-wise, this is a strange, hallucinatory beast. It starts off reading like little more than an excuse mocked up so we have any reason to play as Fark going through the same set of levels, and then it awkwardly lurches into trying to be more than that, but not by much. Fark is likeable enough. He's a mixture of elements from Metal Sonic, Shadow, Meta Knight, and Zero, a rival character, and one with enough going on to turn over in my head a few times, even before the later titles properly flesh him out. A robot built with a singular purpose who has it stolen away by the one he was built to imitate. A headstrong hero who doesn't really understand what's going on, doesn't care, and just dives into the fray. Pushing aside Fark's attempts to get him to stop and ultimately doing what he was unable to, despite that being his sole purpose. Being a month old, with no set personality beyond what his mission required, his failure leaves him adrift, frustrated and unsure of who or what he's meant to be. I love the irony that he stole Spark's job, only for Spark to unwittingly do the same to him. Karmic justice from a formic jester. It can't be said the game is devoid of good subtext, this is a really funny underlining. Plus it's a comedic spin on the rival dynamic typical in Sonic games. Ironically enough, Sonic and Spark are both rather static characters, they're both self-assured and don't change much, but through their actions inspire others to grow. With Sonic it's through his good nature and heroism. Meanwhile Spark is just an almost one-track twat who just wants to drive his boot up Fark's ass, which gives Fark a boot drive filled with self-doubt. And in the aftermath of all this, Fark gives himself his own boot up the ass. I'd like to say I did extrapolate this from the game, but then the art book just says a lot of this outright, so I'd say for all of the clunkiness this story can convey what it needs to. As the story goes along, it culminates with the reveal that Freon's destruction turned him into a decentralized consciousness, his virus no less potent, the new bosses we've faced are him fighting for control of Fark's mind. These bosses are joined by a really cool new track by Andy Tunstall. It's the only song in the game with lyrics, and taps directly into the part of me that loves Crush 40. It's a perfect fit for this scenario, and the fact it had lyrics alone worked to show Fark as the more introspective and troubled character. And this gives us the strength to see Freom and Fark self-doubts off, Fark endeavouring to find his own purpose in life. For all of my praise and how much I do enjoy Fark in theory, in practice this plot just doesn't have enough going on for the big thematic statement to land. Fark pushing Freom out of his mind, declaring that since Freom gets in the way of people fulfilling their own purpose and dreams, he must be stopped. It's a good time, but it clearly wanted for a bit more depth than it could manage. The story ends with Spark saying this story sounds wild, and they should talk more. Might not be a bad idea. Spark is a maximalist platformer, throwing so many ideas in at once that it should not work, but it gets by on relentless momentum and confidence, even as it lacks Sonic's own momentum. 
The gameplay is unbalanced yet joyful, the story gutsy yet gutted, the world is two-dimensional with depth. It wears its every influence on its sleeve, and my word, is it well tailored. This is my favourite 2D platformer. More so than any Sonic game. I like it more than 1, 3 and K, and Mania. It's 4 hours long on a good run, and I wish it was a little cut down, but the end of the journey always satisfies. It's a game where I have a lot of gripes with it, with issues that are easy to point to, but always overshadowed by how much fun I have with it regardless. Sega used to have a slogan which went, To be this good takes ages. Well, Lake done it in one. This may be one of the most pleasant surprises I've ever experienced. So, let's move on to the game that japed me into playing this one. Initially, Lake didn't intend to make a sequel to Spark, and even took a few months break from production of the first title. In that time, he started putting together a Unity-based 3D Sonic engine called Hedge Physics, because his breaks are more productive than my work days. It was intended to be a base for others to make 3D Sonic fan games, just as Worlds had given Lake his start several years in one dimension earlier. And in some fun trivia, Danazine was once again there to help with the coding, supplying the code that is the backbone to the entire program. I sort of love the instructions. To use, get Unity, learn Unity. To make levels, get Blender, learn Blender. Lake doesn't beat around the bushings. Following Spark 1's release, what he first turns his attention to is another attempt at XF. Both Hedge Physics and this second crack at a racing title are stymied by a lack of programming prowess, but ultimately the platformer would once again lap the racing game. Lake had found that Fark made a good impression and he could maybe make a title centred on the robot. It then clicked for him. And what really motivated me to actually work on Spark 2 was that I got a 3D Sonic game engine ready and was like, huh, I could use this for my original game. He had just bumbled into the exact tools he needed that he himself made. So he took that, the art style from Racing Institute, and work began on Fark the Electric Jester. The title was later changed because it was fucking terrible. So open Spark the Electric Jester 2, with Fark in Armstrong's lab. The game begins by confirming that, yes, Fark has been strong-armed out from under Armstrong, as he woefully recounts the events of last game, how he failed in his mission and got his embarrassing moniker. He questions who and what he truly is. Meanwhile Spark, well, he's off on holiday with a blank check given to him by Armstrong. And I sort of lied about Fark's story from last game. It wasn't rewritten per se, but it didn't quite open with Fark at Spark's place. It actually opened with a message declaring that what we're about to play is an alternative world, with Fark's true destiny elsewhere. This places Spark 2 as one of the odder sequels I've played, both because its titular character, while a motivating force, never actually turns up, and because this is actually a do-over of a side story from the prior game, retold in such a way to make it a sequel. I'm impressed by how it's emulating Sonic's absurdist continuity mishmash, and within one game too. Record time, 50,000 points. Armstrong tries to comfort the cogs, saying that Fark isn't such a bad name, which, well, we're playing Spark 2 here, mate, and ultimately offers to root around in his code to see if that might lead to some answers, which amps the android up. But before they can begin... Cheers for that, I was not enjoying looking at him. You can tell from the first cutscene the tone is going to be quite a bit different. Fark is a much more doubtful, introspective character, and the setup is a lot less silly, but a lot more cheesy. I do also appreciate that within the first cutscene, the rival character now has a rival character. Gameplay begins, and it's... alright. The first level, FM City, makes for an okay showcase of what lies ahead. While Spark 1 made its gameplay ideals clear in the first 30 seconds, the sequel takes its entire first stage, which, well, isn't much longer. Opening with ramps leading to two pathways, a player who has a grasp of the momentum-based physics can ramp their way up to the higher lane without needing the slower springs. Next up is a very skippable field of foes, and a spring leading up to a loop-de-loop -loop, which descends into a long straight with speed boosters, letting the player feel how Fark functions at speed. The third segment of the stage is more or less a multi-layered jungle gym, giving the player ample opportunity to climb and test out Fark's various jumps, before one last loop-de-loop -loop and various ramps to run up to the exit, making sure the player knows how to scale surfaces. It's a short and demonstrative opener, useful but not what I would call thrilling. Though perhaps its thrill lies in the simple fact of what it is. 
The music is a remix of FM City from Spark 1, where that track was a starting point before the game and music quickly diverged, revealing its true non-Sonic colours. This mix evokes Sonic Adventure rather heavily, an influence this game commits to. There's a strange thing I learned recently. I'm not smart enough to know if it's true, but, you know, comments can correct me. The modern American accent is closer to Old English than current British accents, which have developed, or devolved if you prefer, into what it is today. Well, Spark 2 is sort of like that in regards to 3D Sonic, and it can talk the talk. Sonic Adventure is my favourite Sonic game. I love how it plays, I love how it feels, and I love how ambitious it is. Of course it has a lot of issues, but I think it's why I have a love for stranger, rougher games today. And I wish 3D Sonic had stayed along this course, translating its 2D concepts into 3D. Instead, later 3D titles sidestep the difficult to implement mechanics like momentum, loops, and complex stage layouts, leading to far more heavily scripted experiences with linear stages and heavy use of set pieces. Where moves like the spin dash were interpretive tools for building speed and getting past obstacles, abilities became set solutions to static problems. It removed all the freedom of older Sonic titles and the sense of speed has felt relatively shallow since. And to be clear of all this, I do still like 3D Sonic. Quite a bit, actually. And I understand why it had to simplify back then, and what we have now is the result of two decades worth of complicated problem solving and tinkering, but a greedy part of me has always wished it didn't go down the free lane path that it did. What I'm basically saying is that later 3D Sonic titles are the British accents of gaming. It's a bit naff, innit? After Spark 1 diverted from 2D Sonic, Spark 2 is everything cool about 2D Sonic and the adventure games, gameplay of 1 and tone of 2, made modern, with tight, reliable movement, and camera controls that make sense. Not to mention an almost boost-era sense of speed working within an adventure-style framework, all while achieving things Sonic hasn't managed. It can even do proper loop-de-loops. It's a revolution. This is the American accent the offshoot that's somehow closer to the roots. That's the thrill. And yet, I don't love it. Why is that? It is a sharper, refined version of a gameplay style I adore, with enough new ideas to make it familiar yet distinct. Fark moves okay. Impressive looking and precise maneuvers are easily done after getting to grips with the controls, which doesn't take too long. I rarely feel like the game has screwed me over when I misjudge a jump. Undershooting or overshooting always felt like a misjudgment on my part. It's thrilling to arc through a piece of level like Grease Lightning, yet it also isn't. Fark has an almost weightless quality which makes navigation less satisfying. The only feeling of resistance comes from when Fark is running like the wind, which appropriately enough brings us to some Sonic-styled glitchiness. At first, it seems sensible. Because you're moving fast, it becomes harder to turn because of momentum. But the model for how it handles this is jerky. If you try to make small adjustments, it often feels like the game doesn't really register them. Meanwhile, if you push the sticks even slightly too far, the physics can freak out and bring you to a halt. The thrill of running fast is very much present, but always tainted by that bit of unfairness, of having to keep the game's arbitrary nature in the back of your mind, of needing to hit an uncomfortable middle ground while clearing a lot of ground. It weighs down on the gameplay, an irony, because that's the only time there's much weight to go around. After clearing the stage, we come out onto a world map. This menu is a positive addition overall, though obviously it does mean the feeling of a journey of interconnected levels is completely absent, an issue I'll get more into as we go along. Stage 2 is FM Downtown. It's a bit different from any downtown I've ever seen, looking like an impressionist mix of a public bath, skate park, and water treatment plant. It has an odd structure, a series of straightforward large rooms with over and underwater layers, Staying topside is ludicrously easy, and if you just run forward, you miss a majority of what the stage offers. Which is very easy to do, as while it is filled with side rooms, hidden nooks, and odd winding paths back onto the main route, there's very little to draw a player's eye to the sides. It's like the level itself is hiding from you. That said, we do get some underwater segments which are no less straightforward, there's no risk of drowning, and then we run down and around some big-ass tunnels. Fark's movement kit is interesting. Apart from removing the dodge, the dash remains and keeps all of its nuances from before, and in this 3D environment is a vital tool in wall running. Oh yeah, on top of loop de loops true freeform wall running is also in, and it controls very nicely. The jumping in this game is very well tuned, both long and short jumps control well, and I do like how the jump is handled. Every time you leave the ground, you're permitted one double jump, a certain number of dashes dependent on your jester power, and one charge dash. 
which does bring me to the new moves. The charge dash is basically the spin dash, though charging it does halt vertical momentum, so it can be used as a lifeline in case the player does miscalculate a jump. Again, I find it funny that Spark 1 moved away from Sonic, meanwhile Spark 2 is giving importance to elements 3D Sonic has largely ran away from. There's also a drop dash, and I'll confess, on my first playthroughs I barely remembered this and the charge dash existed. They seem handy, but the stages never really pull them out of the player. The charge gesture dash is a momentum killer due to its charge, and the game never seems to demand the fine control that the drop dash offers. The two of them being relegated to a shift function also hurts their presence. Spark 2 also brings over the homing attack from Adventure, though only certain enemies are susceptible to it. It even has spiked foes to bait players who mindlessly mash it, and this is only the first way in which it rethinks the mechanic. I'll say this now, I think Spark 2 solves the homing attack. Due to the movement Fark has, with his overall speed and ability to use the environment to make massive leaps, the homing attack is relegated to a fallback option for failed jumps. It's the slower, less impressive option. Where in the Sonic series it became a rote mechanic to connect level chunks or else test reflexes, Spark gives it a more interesting and freeform role. This is that same sort of ingenuity I felt playing the old fan games where Lake reevaluates an older mechanic and gives it new meaning. Only this is taking something much more fundamental and making it even more impressive. And on the opposite tact, the Jester powers. There's a lot less of them, they can be found in stages, or bought from a shop on the world map. All for the same price. Yeah, bits now not only refill the health gauge, they act as currency. The shops in this world truly do charge you, letting you pick out powers, or else buy art you would otherwise have to hunt down in stages. Base Fark has a fairly fleshed out kit in this game, and perhaps as a result of that the Jester powers aren't as mechanically different. They're closer to animation sets than distinct move sets, their actual difference is muted. Only Edgy edges the others out thanks to its free air dashes and absolutely wonderful shadow send up. It even uses the hover boots in fights, which is rad as hell. Though this does bring me to combat. On the outskirts of town, Fark catches up to EJ, with the Doctor nowhere in sight. EJ says he has orders from Freon to kill Fark. And unlike last time, it's a surprise that the big robo is back. But rather than face us himself, EJ sicks Rhino Dino on us. And thus begins our first boss fight. Alright, I'm gonna have to talk fast for this because this isn't gonna take long. Combat in Spark 2 is a slap fight between soap bars and it is not clean. It plays very loosely like Metal Gear Rising with light attack strings and heavy finishes. There's no real utility to different combos, no launches that work on bosses or utility moves. So once I figured out the most damaging string, I gave the bosses a combo splatter and all you can eat buffet are for battering. As you deal out damage, you build your static bar, which now offers an ongoing damage multiplayer which does more to hurt variety even foes. As like in Spark 1, you can cash in your power bar for a really big attack, but a constant damage multiplayer never really feels worth well risking a big charge attack, especially in a combat system this fast and unreliable. And no, you don't need to vary combos to build meter, like maybe Bewitched by Bayonetta, but but these brawls are basic. Okay, the boss is probably over. And compounding on all of this is the parry. Fark has had a firmware update, making him far firmer and much more hard wearing. Now instead of freezing you in place and having a semi-tight timing, the parry window is seconds long and does not stop you from bringing the pain. It doesn't inhibit movement whatsoever. It's amusing, but makes the combat even more farkical as boss battles all devolve into rushing in, spamming the same combo, and the moment an enemy flashes or looks to move, hold down parry and keep slapping away. And what with the particle effects, the hardest part of battles is seeing some of the less telegraphed attacks amidst all of the fireworks. The bosses try to be distinct from one another, but this really comes down to stopgap measures, delays or impediments to an imperfect routine and beyond perfect parry. It never actually feels like I'm battling the boss, but fighting their health bar. And to get even crazier, the parry can still deflect stage hazards. Spinning blades, trains, the cannon of a spaceship from inside of the barrel. But this is boring. We've been here before. So now, it can even parry the hereafter. You can parry death itself. So that's incredible, but it's so easy to do that it does defang the stages, turning them from obstacle courses to soft play arenas. I spent more time in parry here than in the bloody saboteur. There is a difficulty selection in this game. All it does is affect damage received, but I think it should have also made block timing stricter. This is solely a feature of the gimmick challenge difficulty. I think these two should have risen in tandem. There's a new boss track and it's pretty good. Much like Fark's previous boss music, it's meant to have lyrics which kick in at the halfway mark. They're fun in that butt rock way and naturally laden with foreshadowing. 
foreshadowing which relates to this game and the sequel in slightly different ways, which is pretty nifty. But since these rumbles rarely broke 70 seconds, and I cut a good few of them down to half a minute, I never actually got to hear much of these lyrics. Spare the lightning rod and spoiler the boss fight, I suppose. After the fight, Fart goes to get the lay of the land, and is surprised by a familiar face. Romolo! Having been freed from the first Freon virus by the Doctor, he's out here trying to find the guy. Now disconnected from the net, he figures himself safe from Freon's current influence. This story subscribes to the idea that the internet rots your brain. In an amusing bit, Fark aggressively demands everything Romolo knows, learning what EJ is up to. He then awkwardly apologises for the lip before making his way. I find it cute that he's literally not built to be polite. Romolo then flies over to Astra. They share some clandestine banter about how they have to keep watch of Fark, and how as an agent of clarity, she fears he could be a worse threat than the big man himself. Spark 2 is going to be by far and away the wordiest entry in the series. Almost like a second go at Chrono Adventure, though this one is handled a lot better. Where Chrono had me feeling like I was only getting unhelpful snippets and incomplete pieces of a larger world it really wanted me to understand, Spark 2 is far better at actually building intrigue which unfolds in a natural way. Its answers are easy to guess, but I'll take that over the convoluted mess of Chrono. I don't want to be chasing the story, I want to have a fun time following it. Next up is Floria Highway, which makes for a nice burst of speed. A long series of winding roads linked by what I presume are construction platforms. It's a fun run, but highlights more than any other a consistent issue of Spark 2's stages. The levels are often barren and really struggle to pull the player into challenge and excitement. I went over how fun I find how far Fark can frisk, but I also went over vast swaths of the bloody stages doing so. It's a strength and a weakness, a ton of challenges which in other games would be involved, multi-jump affairs and seem designed to be here, are sailed over with nary an interaction. This issue extends to enemies which hurts them more than you ever will. In an interview which came out around the time of the game's release, Lake admits a frustration that in the original title enemies could be bypassed far too easily, and Spark 2 had not solved the problem. There's an irony in that while this stage is perhaps the worst for it, it's also the first of just three mandatory combat encounters. Stage mini-bosses are far lesser in quantity and quality. You can tell in this game that Lake is figuring out 3D design where the prequel was a result of years of 2D tinkering. The following Floria plant is a bit better. Sort of. This area is built around lava pools and wall running. I love darting up the lava flow with a series of ramp jumps. It's one of the few obstacles the game has which feels properly tuned for the player's agility. You're also sent sprinting through lava tunnels and I'm pretty certain the game is only happy for you to run along the ceiling and bypass all of the platforming below. Stages do somewhat distinguish themselves with their own rhythms and obstacles, but as said it can't quite find its feet when it comes to keeping yours on the ground, and attempts to do so are awkward speed killers which hardly even work, rarely halting the player for long. This all goes along with the parry and making stages feel frictionless and solutions samey. On a casual playthrough, level-to-level -level experiences are rather similar, and that's because you can't feel bumps in the road when you're a mile in the sky. Electricity follows the path of least resistance. Make that too easy and you make a game where you essentially skip all the meaningful content without even thinking about it. The first time I finished Fark, I felt like I'd barely played a game. Does the fault lie with me or it? I'm genuinely of two minds about this because despite how critical I'm being, there is a thrill in doing all of this, in seeing these laid out intricate challenges and cutting the Gordian loop de loop, but it's not exactly a well-rounded experience. Meanwhile, some robots are looking at Fark's stupidly round bont. This is our boss squad and I've grown to like these guys. And that goes double for double. We have, uh, Double, who I've now introduced twice. He's the leader of the pack, and rather upset that the liberation of robots is almost at hand, because that means the killing's done. Flint is the conscience of the group, seemingly loyal to Double, but clearly not quite as gung-ho, and he cares a good deal for Float. The two found her during the fighting, she has no memories and seemingly just does as these two do out of friendship, and for now, they're confused by what they see, doubting that Fark's body can be as powerful as the readings warn them. Double is willing to go after the robot, but isn't really amped up by the idea. Then the scene is stolen by EJ, shrieking at the free to get to work. And they're unimpressed, only going along with Freon for kicks.
put in his place and embarrassed, EJ can only stew in his weakness. This scene is where the Spark 2 demo ended, and that demo is the closest this series has ever come to actual controversy. But for the last reason you might expect, buckle in. It turns out that Spark 2 also saw rewrites, and that's because it was originally going to feature excessive swearing. And I gotta ask, what the fuck is all that about? People found it really out of place and off-putting, and while Lake did push back, he did ultimately remove the cursing. And honestly, I do think the game is better without it. Even though it does have a comedic point, it's clearly over the top on purpose and there is a target for the parody. Double and EJ are the only two to F and Jeff, and they're the edgiest characters by far. But to focus on EJ, I really do find him an interesting character conceptually and in execution, and his colourful commentary was a part of that. EJ and Fark feel like really interesting, contrasting interpretations of Sonic's rivals, particularly Shadow. Fark represents all of the earnest aspects of that kind of character, a moodier and more serious version of the light-hearted lead, one which complements the main character's own temperament while being able to carry their own story. He's Shadow in Sonic Adventure 2. Meanwhile, EJ is everything shallow about Shadow, an edgy out-of-place twat trying too hard to be cool. He's Shadow the Hedgehog in... Shadow the Hedgehog. Only while that game is an utter cock-up, here Lake is in on the joke. Absolutely no other character respects EJ, and he's the punching bag of every scene he's in. The swearing adds to his ineffectual edge, but is distracting and unnecessary to make the bit work. To put that aside, I love this conflict between what is essentially two takes on the same character. One everything sort of interesting about them done well, and one everything superficial about them done knowingly. Spark may be a send-up to everything that inspired it, but it does remix those ideas in fascinating ways which lets it offer something unique. But it took a couple of goes for this to work for me. The first time I played through Spark 2, I really didn't care for much of it, story especially. I'm not sure what mood I was in, it's just nothing was connecting. Perhaps coming off of how much I enjoyed the first Spark, I was sitting there wishing it had more of what the 2D title offered. I've been harsh up until now and I've got criticisms left, but I'm going to try and work in some of my more positive reappraisals of Spark 2 from here on out. A few months ago I livestreamed the entire series to show it off, especially to a couple of mates of mine. I had just beaten free and was really enthusiastic about Spark. I needed to show people. It may have been the lighter, streaming for fun atmosphere and me going into two with a I promise guys this gets better next game sort of framing as I expected disappointment, but we wound up having a blast. The goofy story reveals and melodrama hit us just right. What did I miss first time around? Well, embarrassingly enough for me, this game tells you how to appreciate it right out of the gate, and it's exactly on my wavelength. This is the start screen, and this is the menu and stage clear background. Metal Gear Rising and Sonic Adventure 2 are its touchstones. And then we have this. Uh, it's got a bit of that sort of action movie cheese to it. Mm -hmm. Which makes it yeah. really enjoyable instead of like super, super grim, dark, and serious. I wanted, as it, I wanted to make it as cheesy. To. I wanted to make it as cheesy as I could. It was my that goal. That's amazing it. to hear. That makes me so <laughs> happy. <laughs> I love, like, I feel like the Sonic series has never matched Sonic Adventure 2 in terms of trying to take it so seriously, but also being kind of like silly at the same time. Mm hmm. I love having a game made by someone else who appreciates the goofy buy-in of Sonic Adventure 2. That's how to appreciate this story. It's of the type that's taking itself seriously, but the author knows how off the wall and goofy it is and has fun with that balance. Willing to accept the juxtaposition of silly and serious, and on the second go around its charms work their way through a lot better. Granted, it is lacking in presentation. Sonic Adventure 2's goofiness is bolstered by sloppy vocal direction. Fine, then just take them. They stink like a kidness. Bad mixing, and much more animated cutscenes. All things which are hard to do convincingly, intentionally, especially with Lake's resources. But this does make Spark 2 feel muted. Dialogue wise, unlike Chrono Adventure and Lake's first take on Spark 1's story, I don't find the banter grating, but not exactly great. It's for the most part fine. Despite the much larger cast, it's far more deft in giving characters distinct voices and goals, which get at least a little exploration, even if they're not quite fully charted. Anyway, I had a turnaround on the story. So let's talk about how I also wound up enjoying the gameplay. In the shop menu, there's a special reward costing zero bits. Super Fark. To unlock it, we have to get every speed and score medal in the game. A daunting task. And I loved it. The next stage, Foresta Blanca. Nice little Sonic Adventure 2 riff. It's a stage I somehow always forget, just before booting it up and going, oh, this is really fun. 
a foggy, snowy forest which trades the curvy highways and platforms for rolling, unnatural scenery. This is Spark 2's snowy peak of momentum-based platforming, and it's a joy to just jump around this place. And speedrunning this stage, much like speedrunning this entire game, takes that to 11, as you really have to grasp the physics and master ramping off of hills. I complained how empty the game feels, but you add a speed requirement and suddenly that empty space sets the pace. The barren stages become intricate puzzles of cut throughs and opportunities for big time saves hidden in plain sight. FM City, a fairly straightforward entry level, becomes the most exacting challenge present, with a 50 second time limit that I've only shaved by milliseconds. Some sections need to be done perfectly, and they need to be done perfectly so you can bypass others. Cheeky inclines which on normal playthroughs seem merely ornamental become instrumental to launching yourself past springs and lifts. So many levels fundamentally change on a speedrun, hidden routes and devious jumps which actually push the limits of Fark's moveset. Let me show you my favourite jump in the game. I felt so good figuring that out, and it remained gratifying to clear on my numerous attempts to crack the remainder of the stage. I slighted the charge and drop dashes, they were cold to me, but under this pressure they turn into diamond medals. The second a charge dash takes to get ready takes on a real risk reward, as it opens up many means to progress. Meanwhile the drop dash quickly restores your jump, and can be used to hit downslopes faster for extra speed. That little bit of extra precision becomes incredibly important. And it's great how the charge dash maintains the nuances of the regular dash. While it does give great speed, you need to use it in conjunction with the geometry to really run like the wind. These challenges also elevate the jester powers, making their slight differences become meaningful. Edgy's charge attack is a momentum affected triple jump. It will only slow a descent, but rocket a Fark already headed up. The Biker Jester can store a boost that's weaker than a charge dash and stricter in its movement, but it can actually be carried. It doesn't halt your movement. This gets even crazier in Spark Speed running with Magnet Dashing. I am not on this level, I just wanted to show you this. Now I was certain I would enjoy the speed runs, but I figured the score attacks would be a dull affair, just travelling about the stage and hoovering up points like Henry in a thumbtack factory. How wrong I was. The way Spark 2 handles score is new to me. First up, you build a multiplier throughout the stage. It can never decrease, but raising the number requires getting good amounts of points in quick bursts. It's a fairly slow paced combo meter, then on top of this is a 5 minute time limit. Go over and your score rapidly plummets back to zero. What this results in is a more complex speed medal, one focused on deft routing and considered pacing. I wound up loving it. You can't just thoughtlessly bumble through grabbing bits and breaking bots, you have to be smart about it. Grabbing every point is far less important than knowing hotspots you can quickly navigate between while steadily advancing towards the end of the stage so that you don't risk running over the time limit. You've got to play this like Beavis and Butthead, looking for ways to quickly score, figuring out what areas have points and which are pointless. Being able to not only speedily navigate across the stage, but how to quickly climb up, down and between routes becomes vital. Your movement is tested in ways even more varied than the standard speed medals. Meanwhile the enemies, typically so easily ignored, become vital, especially the rare but incredibly valuable mini-boss robots. While the combat doesn't become good, it's now part of something that is. On each failed run I could feel myself improving bit by bit, and finally making the goal was always rewarding, feeling like a culmination of all of my planning and practice, giving it the sense of a well-considered challenge. For all of my love, I do have gripes with it. While I just praise the multiplier system, and I find it leads to really tense finishes where nearing the time limit you just start gaining hundreds of thousands of points for every little thing, making the wins feel close yet big, it's so unusual a multiplier system and it starts ramping up so exponentially that it took many medals before I had anything approaching a grasp of how close to my goal I ever really was. As it feels really sudden how enemies go from a few thousand a pop to tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands, and it was hard to gauge how much I needed to do to make them that valuable. It's unintuitive to say the least. And while I did undeniably have fun with these challenges, it doesn't solve the underlying issue. The main game is incredibly lacking for substance. A casual playthrough of the main stages demands very little of a player and offers not much more. On to the next level. Don't know how to pronounce that. Actually it's quite fitting, because up next is a mysterious haunted castle. We join Flint and Float as they look out towards a glowing spire, sure that Spark will scale it to plot his course. Float is to ambush him at the apex, where they either expect her to take the win, or else Fark will run and get caught by Flint or Double. 
who are positioned ahead at Technoria City. This seems like a really flimsy plan, but hey, we need those one-on-one -on -one boss fights. I'm rather mixed on this scene. The two again question if Fart can really be that dangerous. Like Float, he's a custom model, his code only matching one other robot, and that's Freon. Which is less foreshadowing and more a narrative solar eclipse, and makes it even more unbelievable they're going at him one by one. If there is anything in this scene that works, it's the oddly well done and strangely subtle dynamic between Flint and Float. Flint seems apprehensive to send Float off to fight Fark, as well as questioning her lack of memories, on double suspicion anyway, as it leaves her with no clear reason why she fights. Which Float brushes off by joking about how their master isn't exactly a saint. Flint can't argue, and just asks her to be careful, which makes her happy. This is a scene which is better on a rewatch, with more information given later about who these two are. I like it as a re-examination of a boss squad, something closer to MGS2 than Metal Gear Rising, with somewhat complex relationships. Flint and Float have a somber quality which doesn't agree with the lightning bolt pacing. They're the actual emotional centre of the game, but they're off centre. Anyway, Fark begins the stage, and I've got to say, the parry isn't the only thing that makes the world of Spark 2 feel like a block land. I said this was a castle. It even takes inspiration from Hero's Hang Castle mechanically. Actually, the entire stage zeroes in on Heroes, and while it is harsh to compare the presentation of a full studio game against a one-man effort, let alone their first full-fledged go at 3D, I can't pretend I'm fond of how this looks. This doesn't sell me on being a castle, more an abstract series of shapes which doesn't really suggest any kind of structure. This might be appealing to some, and in the right scenario I might dig this look. But here it doesn't do much for me, and it does occasionally hamper gameplay. Because the settings are so surreal, if the player loses the thread of where to go, it can be tricky to pick it up again. Though it's here that this issue is at its most aggressive. Befitting its apparent theme, this is a topsy-turvy trial, where navigation is meant to be more fiendish. But I doubt hidden pits obscured by everything looking exactly the same was part of the plan. Alongside climbing semi-visible architecture that often appears indistinct from mere decoration, only standing out because of how sparse such ornamentation is. This quality does vary level by level. Some stages suggest locations, others mere approximations, which does create inconsistency. And none of this is to say the abstract stages are always devoid of charm. I love the level theming of the otherwise forgettable Scari Astropolis. The use of trains as a hazard returns, and the mix of old-fashioned brickwork, high-tech rail station, and zen gardens is a pleasing mixture. Though I do wish it looked like anything in particular, or told a little tale of the world in itself. And that's how I feel about a good few of these stages. At the top of the tower, Fark confronts Float, who's also a bit let down at this world, for reasons stranger than mine. This exchange is more than a little bizarre, not even Fark can quite follow. He gets sad when Float reveals it's a fact she learned from her friends, asking, You have those? And I'm thinking, Fark, mate, they have one of yours. Okay, actually, no, I, I wouldn't consider Armstrong a friend either. I do appreciate the moment that follows, where Fark responds not with fear or anger that Float's friends also want him dead, but is completely nonplussed. I love that he shares Spark's flippancy towards danger for such drastically different reasons and expresses it in a different way. That despite being a month old and obviously quite naive and new to the world, he's already this world weary. And this throws Float off. Having lost her memories, her only point of reference is Flint and Double, and Fark's attitude genuinely gets to her, which is an intriguing character beat. Anyway, 60 seconds and two forms later and she's dead. She is, to me, one of the trickier bosses. Timing parries is slightly harder because it's like trying to have a rumble in a rain. Her second phase is actually easier because she eases up on the light show. Astro reveals herself. And then starts guilt tripping him over killing Float, giving us the reveal that none of this was out of some grander goal, just loyalty to her friends and in the strangest swerve so far, telling us that Float is actually an android, a formy girl trapped in a robot body, abandoned by the military and fought dead, but kept alive through the machine. And I'm just sat here thinking, alright there, Drebin, 
You're going to get Romolo to do a little monkey impression. This bit of whiplash is where the game pivots, with grim revelations about each character and the tone turning dour. While I'm fond of this story, I feel its compact length does constrain it here, as it could have benefited from a more gradual shift. I wish there was more electricity in the air, not a sudden, awkward jolt. I like the reveal that Float's reason for fighting was that simple and her friends never really knew. I take Flint as harboring some guilt for saving her because that put her right back into danger, but I'm going to be honest, I'm making these comments with a lot of hind and foresight. Not to mention having time to sit down, log these scenes and read and watch them back. There's stuff there, but it isn't all working as these two have barely any screen time and the cryptic, hesitant dialogue is clunky. When it comes to effective depth, this story's reach exceeds its grasp. And with the guilt trip failing to floor Fark, he heads off for Technoria City to rescue his... Acquaintance? Shantoria Town is a great speedrun stage, which works well, there's nothing to see here, being only a marginal improvement from the castle in terms of suggesting a space. This all changes just one level later, as we quickly go from favela to favorite with Technoria City. As Fark arrives, he's contacted by a mysterious AI known as Clarity, made by Armstrong to stop Freon. Fark gets little and has less time to wander, as EJ flies overhead and Fark gives pursuit. And I've got another grievance. Sorry. Now while the castle was me arguing against the topic at its weakest, Technoria is me arguing against it at its strongest. This stage is a showing of what Lake can be capable of, but cannot yet consistently achieve. Technoria is a beautiful cityscape negotiated skyscraper by skyscraper. The sense of scale is impressive and I love the vibrancy. Everything is neon lit and the rooftop parks offer a gorgeous contrast, accented by giant billboards stretching off across the landscape. This level is a visual treat. So I'll admit, this is a very individual complaint, and with the heightened focus on character story, it isn't something that's missing without replacement, the focus is elsewhere. But even at this game's best, it doesn't tell a world story or give a sense of a cohesive setting the same way the 2D title did. It's three-dimensional, but with so much less depth. Let's put aside the city lights so the plot can get yet darker. Fart catches up with EJ. No patience left for his taunting. He demands to know where the Doctor is and a fight quickly ensues, which... Yeah, he puts up about as much of a scrap as you might expect. A beaten EJ retreats to Flint and Double, getting about as much sympathy as you'd expect. And up here, we don't find the Doctor. Freon arrives, announcing the death of Armstrong, but where he left just mysteries in his wake, Freon brings answers. Freon's true name is Unit 1, and Fark's Unit 2. And then Freon just kind of disappears. He's just gone after this shot with no announcement or explanation. It's a weird misstep in a delightfully melodramatic moment. Right in time for Double to steal the scene. Double joking about a touching family reunion, just riffing on what's before him, before trying to get under Fark's shell, I suppose, for being more beaten up about his dad than the Doctor. And when Fark tries to hit back that Double doesn't actually care for the liberation of robots or any high-minded ideal, Double is delighted. This is more of what I wanted. Big emotions and very expressive dialogue. This is the game's comfort zone. Double is very clearly inspired by Sundowner, and my god is he a really nice take on the character, capturing everything entertaining about him with his own little zest. And just like Sundowner, his fight's over before you bloody well know it. And his gimmick? An encore. Or as the French would call it, beast. And, uh, cut to Astra and Romolo stood over Freon's limp body, apparently remote controlled. They wonder what his game is, and then Astra announces they've got a job to do. I like to imagine Freon delivered the news, I'm your pops, and then pop powered down and hit the ground. From awkward joke to awkward endgame, we next join Fark boarding a train to... somewhere. A memorable stage with a fun premise and a solid ramp up in difficulty as there's less ground to go around. He then starts scaling a tower. 
into space. I love Titanic Tower. It's such a fun platforming playground and the music gives it such a light and bouncy tone. Which is cool and all, but we're doing this because this is the literal rising action as we're on our way to fight our genocidal robot dad. We're breaching the atmosphere and buddy, the atmosphere is off. To go back to the last game once more, once you get this big plot dump, the rest of the game is a thrill ride and you're equipped to know why things are happening. Spark 2 is kind of the opposite. I know now where Fark is going and why, but it feels like once all of the inciting questions are answered at the three quarter mark, everything awkwardly jaunts onwards towards a conclusion without telling the player what Fark is doing. And that's incredibly funny given he is literally running into space. This is all especially ironic come end game. We cross paths with Flint one last time, giving us a pretty hardcore line. He swears revenge for Float but says if he's the one to die today, do not trust Clarity. The battle ends with Flint beating a retreat. And there we go. The saga of Float and Flint ends there, sort of anticlimactically. At least for now. Then we get to Planetary Stripe. This is another great stage. It's one of the most mechanically simple, but works so well in story, pacing, and challenge. We're running along the ring of the planet, I think. What's going on over there? That's all this stage is. There are no foes or gimmicks beyond that save for gravity shifting to change lanes. All we're doing is running on thin runways. Something which I've said is mechanically stilted. Why it's so cool is that it feels like we're ramping up the pace in tandem with the story, rushing towards a conclusion. And this is matched by the central tension of the stage. With the gravity gimmick, winding tracks, and space backdrop, it's hard to tell when you're the right way up, meaning that slowing down, hesitating, or failing to stay on course may be a death sentence. And if you do survive, getting back up to speed is difficult by itself. It all sells an idea that if Fark puts a foot wrong now, he's already dead. It's a strong level, great individually and in its place in the story, while appropriate pacing-wise, which is sadly not the norm. So much of Spark 2 is made up of elements and ideas which are nice taken on their own, but aren't working together as a whole. And on that note, this whole ramping up towards the finale is undercut by the lack of feeling of a journey and the world map. This screen has undeniable benefits, but in combination with the awkward storytelling, it repeatedly kills momentum and makes this whole endgame lack for impact. Luckily, the next level again manages to claw out some individual excitement. Welcome to Hyper Aff Fleet, a remake of the best stage from Spark 1. It's an impressive level. I'm sort of sad we don't get a remix of its music like FM City, instead getting a chopped down variation, which is unfortunately appropriate. Lake cannot yet recreate the sense of internal progression in storytelling. It lacks that dimension. Like the escape sequence set piece is somewhat recreated, but I didn't defeat a boss or do anything. I just dropped down a shaft and shafted the whole ship somehow. Time to go. This is a 3D translation of a 2D stage, and fittingly for Fark, it's a bit of a machine translation. I apologise if I'm coming off harsh. The irony is, is that while this whole thing is a throwback, it's also a sign of things to come, which will soon be done a lot better. There's bombast, bespoke stage hazards, a sense of place, and actual set pieces. And most importantly, the tighter quarters and stage layouts actually push the player into facing danger head on. I mean, the parry still parries, but hey. Despite my gripes, it is a very good stage. And we're not the only ones beating our feet to get on the fleet, as the fittingly named Astra has also made her way up. And she's not pleased. EJ? Okay, never mind us. I'm more impressed with a guy who limped into orbit. When he sees Fark, he starts raging, but his yelling is interrupted, and we get a strange revelation. The doctor's fine. Well, he isn't fine. I mean, look at him, but he's alive. EJ complains about his lot in life, and then turns around to see a lot of him. So if the idea he's a riff on Shadow the Hedgehog a la Shadow the Hedgehog wasn't clear enough for you, there it is. I really do like EJ and how the game handles how pathetic he is. And in this moment, he goes from comedically pitiable to genuinely so. Astra runs him through, and then the rest of him explodes for some reason. I'll assume she did that. Her attention then turns to Fark. With the reveal that he's Freon's son, she believes he's here to take his place, and that he rejected his mission from Clarity. Fark then asks his big question. 
It's a central theme that's handled a little awkwardly. This is meant to be the shadow slash Raiden moment where they think for themselves, but that lightning doesn't quite strike thrice. I'm gonna be honest, I feel like much of this ending fits better with Fark's former origin story, a product of Armstrong built purposefully to take down Freon, instead of being Freon's son built for reasons unknown. I say that knowing how the plot falls apart were that the case and what's coming later, but none of this really flows for me. And that's because Fark has been completely self-directed. He chose to go after the Doctor and after learning his origins, chose to go after Freon, all along surrounded primarily by characters who are intentionally mysterious in their motives. They're loyal to means, mates, and manipulators. The only two who are wholly dedicated to missions are EJ and Astra. Again, I find this plot entertaining, and I believe the thematic stuff is done more for stylistic send-up and motivation rather than a big message, but all of the subtext is wired up wrong. Fark says whatever he does from now on will be his own decision. So the agent of clarity makes an astronomical mistake. It's a shame Romolo has been reduced to a bit player. He was a fun boss at one point. Astra is struck down, and Romolo makes a startling discovery. Astra was to fake being an organic to carry out her mission. The last we see of Romolo is him grieving over his friend's body. Genuinely, this is the last we're going to see of him in the series. Bye, Romolo. And into the final level, the excellently named Apocalypse Thruster. It plays like a combination of the prior two, with the thin runways of Planetary Stripe and the relentless danger of Hyperath. The game's just showing off at this point. If a 3D Sonic game ever put the player on a beam this thin with the controls and camera it has and asked us to actually platform over the thing, it would be a Sonic misadventure rather than the intimidating yet perfectly doable challenge it is here. And this all culminates with us walking over the thruster. A terrifying prospect, especially when it's the last hurdle of a speed medal. Asking for the most delicate movement right at the last second with the threat of cremation inches away. But the real fire here is the music. I'd call it my favourite original stage track, but... Oh, I'm just having a laugh. Honestly, the soundtrack for 2 I just didn't find as memorable. Perhaps partly down to the less evocative stages. Maybe it's down to not being stuck with them for 10 minute chunks. It maintains one's eclecticism, but it's not the 100% hit rate of that first game. Fart comes face to face with Freon, who reveals his plan. Freon was built by Armstrong to guard Megarath, and the supercomputer's true purpose was clarity, an AI that would safeguard life. Unfortunately, because Armstrong is the most useless scientist going, he majorly bungled it. The AI went rogue, and decided that to truly protect life, some would have to go. Freon was compelled by clarity to eradicate the Formies, an order he couldn't ignore. <laughs> The robot uprising began, but it was with Freon's defeat at Spark's hands he learned the truth, that robots too would be eliminated. The virus was actually Clarity, and she's now spread across the entire planet's network. The only option left is to crash Megarath into the surface, wiping out all life and Clarity along with it. He's a bit of a one-trick pony, but this is a decent escalation from last time, or de-escalation if you prefer. Then. He offers Fark a chance to join him and stand at the beginning of a new world, where every being will be built for a purpose. Fark refuses to join Freon as a destroyer, and vows to stop him and Clarity both through other means. Freon bluntly asks, why, if he even cares about this world? And in an answer I find very interesting, Fark hesitates. He looks inside himself, and there's nothing there. He doesn't care. But seeing Spark, and his simple happiness, he thinks there has to be something worthwhile. Something that he wants to find for himself. I find this does salvage the previous scene a little, and it's overall a character beat I'm quite fond of. While the twist of Fark's origin can only be made more obvious were the words Property of Freon filed into Fark's Forax, and even then only marginally so, there is a fun irony in that Fark set off on much of this adventure to discover who he is and set himself apart from Spark. He learns that while he's only superficially a copy of the Jester, he is a literal clone of Freon. And when confronted with Dad's ultimate goal, he finds himself, as we'll come to learn begrudgingly, wanting to be more like the other guy, the one who jerked him around and stole his purpose. It's a funny thing that in this very weirdly told, cheesy, 
often daft, but usually entertaining story. It does occasionally hit on a very deft and intricate bit of characterization, often understated and just as oddly told as anything else. Not to mention, I just enjoy wrapping up Fark's arc, not with a definitive answer, but further uncertainty. Though I'd like this more if Fark had much of anything going on beforehand. Ironically, the character I praised for being an intentionally shallow comparison was also more developed than him, and that's awkward to contemplate. And so begins the final battles, and it's the same old, same old. After his defeat, Fark finds himself in a void, face to face with Freon's true form. The prototypical son returns, turning an in-joke around into an actual development. A weakness given to him by Armstrong. His actual body is tied to this chair. Every version of him we've faced is a robot shell given his data, which... I'm gonna be honest, I have no idea how much of a weakness that really is for anyone but this guy in particular. Unit 2, Fark, is also a copy of his fundamental data, but with one very odd difference. Legs? Or that. Immediately putting that power to excellent use, Fark adopts the kookiest super form I've ever seen, and I'm on board. This whole ending sequence still has a bit of a spark to it. Even if I feel in pacing and scale, it can't really approach the first game, an issue of structure as well as a struggle of tone. This is me looking back on it and being in too deep. In the moment, playing it, streaming it with friends, it's easy to get caught up in the silly, imaginative hype of it. Half laughing with the game and half really excited to be there for the ride. It's only when you stop and examine it, you realize it may not be completely up to code. This battle is joined by an amazing new vocal track from Andy Tunstall, which thanks to the mid-fight cutscenes, you'll actually hear. These lyrics probably the clearest image of Fark we're going to get, joined by a nice callback to the lyrical theme from the first title, as well as being a remix of that game's ultimate boss track. It's the moment Fark, inspired by Spark, decides to be his own person. Fark is still filled with self-doubt and knows there will be troubles ahead, but is ready to face them head on, assured of his free will, and ready to step out of the shadow of the two people who shaped him, while acknowledging there are parts of them he aspires to. It's good stuff, it is a bit of interesting character depth. The development may be quick, but it is another little hint that he is now thinking for himself. And gameplay-wise, it's still a boss fight. How is Super Fark in ordinary stages since I did go to the trouble of getting him? It's a bit boring, honestly, but I don't actually begrudge it because I had fun enough getting him. The game ends with Fark proving how cool he is. On the ground, Armstrong and Flint look on, knowing their jobs are far from done. And we once again get those charming credits. These really do benefit from 3D. Another endearing, humble beat to go out on. Fuss ends Spark. Or Spark 2. Or the Spark 2 remake of the Fark story in Spark 1. A fun if flawed game, 
but an important step forward. On my first playthrough, I didn't care much for this game. It failed to grab me. On my second playthrough, streamed to friends and an audience, with my own expectations set low, the half their gameplay and absurd plot were a joy. Coming back to these levels with more skill made them more fun as I showed off the goofy physics and sped through stages. I jumped higher and left with a heightened impression. Another replay by myself to get all the medals and I found how the challenges gave the game some juice. My experience and shifting opinion of Spark 2 is an odd one. The gameplay is a refinement of a style abandoned all too soon and is undeniably an improvement upon it in theory. But that gameplay is let down because it lacks what adventure had in variety, challenge and, well, adventure. But if you push this gameplay to its limits, there is fun and friction to be found. It shouldn't be on the player to give the floaty mechanics weight, but it is undeniably there. And the story is sort of the same. Odd both in the moment experiencing it and examined more deeply, with odd and uncommon contradictions. In the moment the story can be goofy and entertaining, but you have to see past its very muted presentation. I'm glad the game doesn't have voice acting, but it needed something to make its unclear tone more apparent. Yet in the right mood, the right environment, examined the right way, the goofiness comes through. The plot? when looked back on or examined more deeply, can fracture further. It's not a tale really calling out for much scrutiny, but there are interesting moments and ideas which work well in the abstract, some of which are salvaged by the sequel lending context. There are beats, which are really fun to ruminate on, and others which leave you more questioning than wondering. The conflict between Fark and EJ is a really fun riff on the rival dynamic, but Fark himself feels like an empty vessel without that contrast and his own story only gets interesting in the 11th hour, or the second if you play it casually. A robot built for purposes unknown, who fails in what he believes to be his goal and is then left adrift. When his chance at an identity is stolen from him, he goes on an adventure to get that chance back and in the process creates it for himself. That's really neat on paper, but that idea needs more time than it's afforded and Fark never really feels plugged in to his own plot. In this story of Fark trying to find himself, it often feels like Lake is struggling just as much. It's a story that's at its most enjoyable when it's being ridiculous, when characters make grand hammy proclamations. But in its more quiet moments, its ruminations and explanations in why things are happening that it can't ever find the right words. It feels wanting and can't quite land the Metal Gear style character beats. Subtlety is not its strength. Double is a fun show stealer, and there are hints of unease between him and his two cohorts, Flint and Float. And you may think I've given their story a little too much credit. And in this title alone, I have. Before Spark 2 finished development, Lake said he had a really ambitious game in mind for the future. While he kept it vague, he said Spark 2 was the groundwork for this title, and seems to have accidentally called it filler for what's to come. Mm, I mean, I have this game that I have in mind. Uh, Spark 2 is kinda a filler to that game. Uh, it really isn't. It does have like some really important plot points that couldn't really be dismissed, but... Yeah, it's pretty much a, like a kind of a gap between this game I have planned and uh, the original Spark. All along, what we've really been playing has been setting the stage for what comes next. And what's weird is, that may not have meant Spark 3. This gameplay foundation, these story elements, might have led to something else. The first time I beat Spark 2, my final thoughts were wishing that Lake had stuck to 2D, and considering how I massively prefer 3D platformers and have longed for someone to pick up Adventure's Torch. This was a damning appraisal. But at that time, I hadn't played before and after the sequel. I'm not sure I'd even heard of Chrono Adventure. What I didn't know then that I know now is just how much Lake improves each and every time. In the end, the next game is not going to give me what I wished for. It will instead give me everything I didn't know I wanted and a whole lot more. So why did Spark 3 come to be? Lake has stated he never really makes these games with the intention of sequels, but two ended on a cliffhanger and more than a few unanswered questions. But it's much more to do with gameplay. Like, I have no idea how I did it. It was fairly hard and I'm not sure if I did it correctly, which is why I made Spark 3. I felt like I could have done, done uh, Spark 2 a lot better. Spark 2 was like all the Spark games really never really planned to have a sequel, exactly. It was a game short on content and highly experimental, reworked tons of times but never quite coming together, even on release. Spark 3 was going to apply every lesson learned, and this time, 
it was going to get it right. Instead of Spark, it was first set to feature Choco, a customizable for me. And while I like the idea of a series where the titular character never turns up beyond the first entry, Spark wound up nicking her main character slot. And Jacket, the thieving little bugger. It is a nice addition. Spark translated to 3D alright, pretty much as is. But the for me is pretty formless. The coat lends him some definition. The game was slated for a September 2022 release, which slipped into August because Lake has once again turned into Rapids. Oh, and of course, can't forget, another version of XF came and went, unable to make it to the finish line. Alright, we're starting on the hottest cold open ever. The way the music is cued to build with the title and level cards, flowing into exhilarating gameplay, it's a powerful start akin to City Escape, but better because this isn't San Francisco. This is a very zero-waste approach to development. Nothing gets trashed. Immediately I was in love. The lighter tone, more animated presentation, and this change-up for the opening is so strong. Say hello to Spark after the sequel. Alright, the driving is only okay. A simple control model with Mario Kart style drifts to gain speed, a boost refilled by batteries, and steering which could maybe afford to be a little bit less heavy. I find a big part of why it works comes down to how it ambushes the bots and player both. A thrilling way to start, and a promise of greater gameplay variety. Spark 2 was an experiment in 3D. Spark 3 is going to be an experiment on top of 3D, with Lake bringing more into the blender. Car abandoned, we head into Area 1 proper. Terminal Village. Gameplay begins, and it's incredible. Double Moon Villa is, much like FM City, an introductory course to let the player feel out Spark's movement, and I'm happy to say this lightning bug has seen some damping. He has a satisfying heft which Spark lacked. This also comes with a reduction in Spark's agility. He can't jump as high nor as far. On the surface, this may sound like a negative, and yeah, we'll be spending a lot more time there, but this works out for the best. While I'm used to janky, weird movement, others found Fark's quick, weightless quality hard to get to grips with. It was too easy to go too fast. So Lake set about refining it. In Spark 2, Fark was made extremely mobile. His jumps were high, and reaching high speeds was easier. However, for some, this enhanced mobility was a curse more than a blessing, as it could make the game too twitchy and harder to control. Spark 3 aims to strike a balance, being easier to pick up, but remaining in capable hands, as fast as Spark 2. I'd say this balance is struck very well and benefits the gameplay in many ways beyond just skill mastery. Spark can't exactly do everything Fark once could, but it makes getting up to speed and maintaining it a more technical and skilled experience. Not to mention Spark's high speed movement has been smoothed out. He's a lot more manageable now and it's really fun to go like the clappers. There's a far better handle on what the player is capable of overall, and that comes across in that Spark can't just fly overall. Obstacles are more numerous and better placed, and thanks to that lower jump height can't be as easily ignored. But the player may not want to. Stages are laid out to incentivize the player towards danger by making speed easier to gain along those paths. It's bait on the hook that I'll always take. It's this great mix of restricting the player's movement so they have to face greater risks, but then making the rewards so worthwhile. Opportunities for Big Air remain very much present, though they take greater finesse to hit and tend to be better weaved into the roots. Along with feeling more like an option you weigh up, not a get out of jank free card. Not that there's much jank left in the tank here. Alongside this, Spark's vertical momentum has been greatly exaggerated. This adds so much of that heft, and goes to make jumping off of slopes a lot more enjoyable, as well as boosting the usefulness of the drop dash. This is a lot of little changes, but put together it's almost beyond refinement compared to Spark 2. Playing so similarly yet feeling so different, the fun has truly been found, and the simple act of moving Spark around is a joy. Perhaps the biggest change, however, is to the parry. It can no longer deflect stage hazards, and it stops a player dead in their tracks. I know a lot of people enjoyed the old busted parry and I had some fun with it, but having an ignore level button on tap was a bit extreme. It made stages too one note if you abused it. Now it's purely a combat tool and the player has to navigate obstacles naturally. Spark 2 was at odds with its own physics. It had to awkwardly and obviously slow the player down to ensure they would need to face an obstacle or two. The speed broke it. This game lets the speed mend it. 
it's much rarer for a stage to arbitrarily halt the player, instead being a consequence of either sloppy play or just taking a moment to catch your breath or think out what to do next. Something a skilled or prepared player can pretty much always avoid. Not to mention the hazards that need to be avoided and gaps cleared seem to keep in mind a player going both slow and fast. I can't praise this level design enough and I'm far from done. Double Moon does way better than FM as an introductory level. FM could teach a player the ropes, but it was really slack. Double Moon ensures that at least a little bit of movement is taught by having challenges weaved into it. One thing I love about Double Moon is despite being the opening level, it has opportunities for all of Spark's toolkit, even abilities we haven't yet been taught. Now alongside wall running, we got wall walking, which is a form of wall running. It may seem superfluous, being far more linear and restrictive than the kind of wall running we already had, but it allows a player to more easily carry a lot of speed onto and off of surfaces. Coming back to this stage after learning about it has a sort of Metroid quality. It even opens with a prime opportunity for a wall walk which lets you zoom out of the opening section, but it takes a ton of control to pull off smoothly. It's also great for how it sets the tone, with the excitement of the opening car chase, it feels natural that this goes into a bit of a slower, breezy, even sort of cozy place to stroll through. I love the warm lighting, the decals which match Spark's jacket, and the music so full of promise. It sells this place as laid back and beautiful, but keeping a sense of adventure ahead. There's something else about this level that's really, really fun. There's so much of it. Not just in the fact these stages now hover around the three or four minute mark on a casual pace, it's that it would take so much longer than that to see all of it. Have you ever wanted to go off the main course in a Sonic game and explore? Well, in Spark 3, you totally can, for a good number of the levels. The background is often more than just set dressing. It's dressed to the nines at the very least. The whole town which the course zips through is not closed off to the player whatsoever and so much larger than you might expect. And it's a playground all to itself. You can rocket off slanted rooftops, rise up the rooftop run clock tower, and meet the locals. This place has formies knocking around. They're not too impressed. Yeah, nothing to see here. Just the guy who saved the world. Off to do it again. What, just hanging out on your giant divider? Well, aren't we a bit platformy? And this opening stage is only the tip of the iceberg. The sense of scale, spectacle, and surprise is only going to go up from here. It is such a bonkers leap of Lake's 3D capabilities. To not only be able to create so much more content, but of such a heightened standard of quality. This is the difference a single game made. Plus, it isn't just fluff out here. Extra bits, clusters, capsules, and hidden battles are all dotted about for score runs. You can find some enemies you wouldn't normally face until much later in the game. Not to mention, there's extra routes hidden out here. We have levels within levels. Ironically, the most boring thing out here may be the reason all this extra effort was made. I'm talking about the newly added exploration medals. Ten to each stage they appear in? They're well hidden, but... I kind of enjoy wandering the stages on its own merits. These are a bit dull, and I don't believe they get you anything. And well, to return to the plotted course for a moment, what really impresses me is how easy it is to overlook what's out there. Despite how much work was clearly put into the backgrounds, how detailed and intricate they are, the critical path is so well laid out, and these backdrops seem to always appear simple in a really guided fashion. They never distract, override, or confuse the level's flow. It's only as you get out there into them that their actual depth unfurls to the player, and it's always surprising. That's really fun. Even the level finish screens just have this really charming quality. And, um, I guess since I covered the backdrop, Spark wants to cover the backstory. Well, he's actually our subconscious right now, so we better agree with everything he says. He recaps the first two games. Poorly. I mean, he has every right to be confused. What of the rewrite and him not even being there for Spark 2? He has heard that Fark is Freon's son and apparently something called Clarity is the real danger, and he thinks it's all a bunch of crap. Can't really knock him for the incredulity. I was there and I don't believe it. He then starts rambling about how much he dislikes Fark, and that brings us to now. His robo-replica has taken charge of a globe-spanning military called the Fark Force. To halt the spread of clarity, they've shut down the internet and locked down travel. God, what a bunch of effers. It's a great bit of dramatic irony. Anyone who's played the second game knows that Spark isn't playing with a full deck here. He's a little misguided. Meanwhile, from Spark's perspective, it's literally no different from last time. 
No money and robots are running amok, so he's gonna go and put a stop to it. Only this time his motives are downright petty. Because none of this is what really lit the spark. Thanks to the net being down, Spark can no longer get his money. Actually, that isn't true, he totally could. But the lines at the bank were so long and he didn't want to wait. You might be making the Alps out of an anthill here, eh, Spark? Nah, sod that. Down with the Fark Force. This intro's amazing. The excitement of a car, the excellent and well-paced first level, and then the punchline that this, this is why Spark's on a rampage. So now that we're up to speed in more ways than one, we're deposited on the world map and hey, one new pip, two pips, three pips, it keeps going. Spark 2 had 14 levels. Spark 3 has 31, spread over seven areas which make up a main stage, sub-stages, and separate from that 31 are so-called challenges. These are actually disguised tutorials which slowly fill the player in on Spark's full moveset. The sub-stages are shorter, but still tend to beat Spark 2 for runtime while not only maintaining the visuals and design of the main stage, but remixing them into semi-unique environments. The work on display is staggering. Remember the train stage from last time? How that was a standout set piece? The transitionary zone which took us into Endgame? Yeah, here that's a sub-level in the first area. Many of these stages are bonus levels which expand on a gimmick or environment from the area's main stage, or else take place somewhere thematically relevant while offering something new. But there are some objective-based levels which subjectively I care a lot less for. Sometimes they're time challenges, medal collecting which plays a lot like Sonic Adventure's Emerald Hunting, enemy rushes, or they bring back the car, my fondness for it growing a bit less each time. The side stages also tend to be a bit more difficult, demanding greater platforming chops and placing greater emphasis on mastery of a particular concept or gimmick. This ties into the new Freedom Medal system. It takes a certain number of medals to progress through the story and you get one for everything you clear. It's not a perfect system, but it works well enough. I find the mix of challenges and bonus zones a decent compromise for anyone who just wants to get on with the game, as you never need the maximum amount of medals to continue. An impatient player can beeline the bite-sized bits of gameplay found in the challenges, and they'll still go into the later, harder levels equipped with information on how more abstract mechanics work. Meanwhile, someone who wants to tackle more substantial content has more courses, and these stricter challenges will equip them in their own way. I mostly love the fact that it's more stuff to do and the standards are kept so high. It lets the main stage gimmicks have slightly harder variations and more exploration. And while I'm not a fan of all the gameplay modes, the variety is very much welcome. The next stage keeps the variety coming. Level 2 is... Rail Canyon. This is just Rail Canyon. So now we have grinding to deal with and... It's fine. I mean, Spark is clearly magnetized, so of course he'd have it easier than the Hedgehog. Not to rail against Sonic too hard, but grinding in his games is either workable yet wonky, or sensible but simplistic. I've been playing and replaying Sonic Adventure 2 for years, and I've never fully understood it, and Heroes was even worse. Which makes this a surreal experience, playing a send-up to a game I dislike, which focuses on a mechanic I don't like, which has more or less remade one of its worst levels, but it's making all of it work. It's pretty straightforward to start with, crouch on declines to gain speed, mash the boost on inclines to keep it, and the rail hopping mechanic is not a panic attack on tap. I said Spark 2 was an advancement on adventure. Well, to say Spark 3 has gone whole hog would be selling it short. Like Rail Canyon, it's a series of grinding sections and platforming platforms. Unlike Rail Canyon, it's interweaved rather than interspersed between the two, as utilizing speed or clever jumps coming off of a rail lets a player take higher routes or clear a few obstacles. A particularly daring player could skip these things outright. Meanwhile, the rail sections are less about long linear stretches and janky reflex challenges, and more winding intricate tracks which give the player a lot more to do, often showing the player a trickier jump which could cut past a long winding path, taking a quicker but riskier route. Or you could stick to the rails, which are slower but safer. It manages to find a way to maintain that bit of thrilling player freedom without compromising a stage focused on an inherently linear mechanic. Let's change lanes for a moment and talk about the shop. It's now a more fully featured affair, Spark can buy new attacks, movement upgrades, and energy costing powers. This is a leftover from how Choco was meant to have played, and more or less replaces alternative Jester forms. Yeah, I'm sad to say there's been a furrow curbing of Kirby. And the grim irony of this? The one and only Jester power present is the Reaper. As to why this happened, Lake cites the extra complexity of 3D development and not wanting to just replace Spark's default form, which has been a concern since the original game. I joked about his absence from 2 and Choco potentially taking the lead on this one, but thinking back on it, 
Spark the Electric Jester hardly even appeared in the first game thanks to these powers. I said back then his abilities were anything but static. Now they're nothing but. With his expanded arsenal and these abilities, he has a really rich toolset and extra forms struggle to stand out. Reaper's cute, it gives him back his dash dodge, and can be used in the expanded combat for some costume switching combos, but it's now more of a novelty than a major mechanical mix-up. If there's anything which signifies how great these additions are, it's that starting a fresh save after beating the game can feel stifling. I feel genuinely sluggish without these extra moves. Once you have Spark decked out, this gameplay goes from great to amazing. This is joined by the reworked energy meter which governs many of these abilities. First up, there are two more rail abilities. Rail boosting, which costs energy, and regen break, which lets you cash in speed to fill those batteries. These both add more decision making to rail grinding, giving you a bit more to do in this very simplistic bit of gameplay. Regen break can be a game changer. It can top you up as easily as trip you up. You've got to learn to use it. Then we have the energy dash, an instant boost of speed, albeit one governed by energy. I think we now have five distinct dashes in this game and the word has turned into a meaningless mush. Spark's finger gun from the first game returns in the form of the charge shot, and it adds extra depth to weak enemies. Previously just a minor threat meant for homing attacks, now you can do drive-by shootings. Yeah, we're taking notes from Shadow now. Some of the most slick moments come from darting through hordes of weak foes, dodging their gunfire, taking them all out, and then cashing in that energy for a big boost of speed. One last move I really enjoy is the Jester Swipe, basically the light speed dash. Bits no longer refill health, and once you've bought everything from the shop, they become a bit useless. But this allows them to keep some utility as another means to navigate. There are more abilities. We have room clearing explosions, damage and speed ups, a temporary shield and so on. The ones I've talked about are the ones which really define Spark 3 for me. While many of these are taken from Sonic, Spark is still re-examining how they can be used. Abilities such as the Lightspeed Dash, and as mentioned last game, the homing attack, became necessary tools for traversal in those games. Stages were very set challenges, and part of that challenge was applying the correct move to the correct situation. Spark treats these moves less as solutions and more as opportunities. They add greater means to traverse the stage and expand your options, but they come with interesting costs. The Energy Dash and Charge Shot go hand in handgun. The Energy Dash requires energy, which necessitates risk taking to get, and the Charge Shot grants an awesome new way to go about it. The Jester Swipe can be used to get a burst of speed, but it takes some anticipation to line up and will rocket you off in a set direction, which may take recovery, so it isn't always worth doing. These abilities allow Spark to match Fark's agility, but only in controlled bursts which have to be earned, which is a really clever way to keep that sense of freedom, by giving it limitations which challenge the player and pull them into the level, giving the level itself greater presence and substance. And it is such a satisfying flow to fall into, I'm gonna go as far to say the gameplay has advanced so far beyond adventure that it blows it out of the water. One that looks at all of that series' abilities and removes them from many of their contextual shackles, then it makes a few more tricks of its own, and then creates levels which puts them all through their paces. I called Spark 1 more complex but less nuanced than Sonic. This gameplay is both. It's just so much better than... Spark is ambushed by the Guardian. And this brings us to combat, which has seen similar expansion. The parry has been returned to its Spark 1 form. An ill-timed but successful parry deflects damage but knocks you away. A regular deflects damage, and a perfect parry grants energy and opens the foe up. Opens them to what, you ask? Juggling. Yeah, being the real jester, Spark can juggle. Welcome to the circus. The energy meter has been joined by a separate combo meter. That damage bonus is now gained by varying up your attack strings and playing aggressive. Spark has a decent selection of light heavy and heavy light combos. His finger gun can be used to maintain a combo meter and as a juggle tool. He has charge moves and ground smashes. I never got sick of pulling off this combo in particular. In one game, we've gone from slap fights to MGR light. It has actual back and forth and enough depth to sink your teeth into. This is joined by a decent roster of enemies who go some way in varying up these encounters. Sword foes who cut through the arena, archers and grenadiers who force movement, and various mages who add further complications to fights, setting traps and making the player think on their footsies. There's enough here to give the player plenty to think on and do in a fight, while attempting to tie it back into the platformer side of the equation with its movement. Juggling isn't just satisfying to pull off, but a means of herding enemies and keeping yourself away from danger and isolating dangerous foes. 
but it's not quite as good as it could be. I do find enemies a little too passive in terms of moving around in a fight, which undercuts the hazards that are thrown into the mix. Once you have a handle on which moves move mobs, it can go from feeling cool to routine robot rearrangement. Juggling is fun, but it's really the only advanced tech in here unless you start doing crazy dash heavies, which feels more like an exploit than anything else. In terms of depth, the defense game has a lot more going on than offense. Enemies now have unblockables, which force you to jump over their attack or else get out of there completely, and then get back in. The combo meter does meet out reason to vary up what you're doing, but the different strings don't stand out much, lacking unique utility. My biggest consideration was always whether or not a combo had a launcher, so we just go right back to juggling. In terms of criticism this game has received, the combat has been the most common subject. Though this criticism is less about its quality and more about the fact that it's here at all, and I do get why. I like it because I'm at the cross-section of people who love Sonic and Spectacle Fighters both, so I can approach this with a Devil May Care attitude, but let's break it down. While Spark 3 is impressive in getting both of these control schemes to sit on the same gamepad, it's because they're really sat at different tables. In a moment you go from corkscrews to combos, which is a jammy trick, but rather jarring. If you don't love both modes of play, you're going to be putting up with one to get to the other. For those who don't like the combat and are unfamiliar with this kind of gameplay, it's a pretty complicated and demanding system. If you do like the combat and are into it, there's not much until post-game, and it's a pretty straightforward and easy system compared to its peers, which puts this combat in a pretty awkward middle ground. They do undeniably form a rift in the gameplay. Sonic's bosses have been more missed than hit in 3D, but they do logically follow the gameplay. They're navigational challenges which test skills a majority of their games focus on. Making bosses play totally distinct from 90% of the other content leaves the gameplay without climax and the bosses feeling out of place see many of those games' final bosses. Only substages have mandatory combat encounters, which is a fair compromise, but also means the bosses can be left feeling like you're thrown in at the deep end with an unfamiliar yet more demanding style of gameplay. To reiterate again, I like the combat, and I don't want it gone, as this mix does give Spark a unique identity, but it's a criticism that has merit. I still enjoy the bosses and some of the battles, but I don't go out of my way for this experience. On stages with boring encounters, I've even learned how to sneak around them to save time and hit speed medals. Yeah, it turns out this isn't just MGR. We've got some MGS in here too. Metal Gear Spark. Tactical Electrician Action. With all that in mind, The Guardian is a bit of a weird setup. He's a recurring boss and you only need to win on the final showdown. This lets him be leagues tougher than anything else in the early game. He would probably play out best if you lose to him a couple times early on and then clinch him in the final, but if you're familiar with character action or whatever term for this genre makes you least angry, he's pretty easily beat. Ah, uh, I love this guy. And we're met with another rift, but this one emotional. After three of the Guardian's four battles, we're given flashbacks delving into the relationships and motivations of characters past. And for the sake of pacing, I'm going to cover each of them here and now. The first scene goes over Unit 1 and Clarity's relationship. How Unit 1 first met the AI he was made to protect, going from Guardian to Lover, and taking on the mantle of Freon to spearhead the robot uprising. This also expands on Fark's creation, He's a literal product of Freon's insecurities. Due to Clarity's heightened consciousness, Freon knew he'd be left behind. Freon wanted a son who could carry his torch and keep up with his mother, built in his image but created by her. And at his request, he wanted his child to have no memory so that he could realize his own destiny the same way they had, hoping that one day his son might kill him and take his place. And I'm hoping that's not a bizarre either pull. Next, we learn how Double and Flint met. Double was a sentry for a famous artist, who remained a guardian on his estate even after his master's passing. One day a thief broke onto the grounds, and when Double slaughtered the intruder, he awakened to his bloodlust. Meanwhile Flint was a simple construction robot who developed consciousness due to nothing more than a freak accident. Immediately terrified by his surroundings, he attempted to flee and was gunned down by the guards. Just then, Double came onto the scene, raising the sight and saving the felled robot. Recruited into Double's cause, the two gave each other names and began their training. But it was on the first mission Flint came to learn of Double's true nature, that his claims of fighting for the liberation of robots was merely an excuse to kill. After a fight with no winner, the two parted ways. The last flashback then goes over how Flint found Float, 
alone, scared, and unable to remember how she came to be this way. Upon catching sight of herself, she breaks into tears. Doing his best to comfort her, Flint goes and fetches some clothes, and the two begin to travel together, until one day a malicious signal went out. Flint manages to delete it before he gets overrode by Freon's virus, and even though Float isn't connected to the net, he's not sure whether or not she got infected. Shortly after, Double tracks the two down and more or less conscripts them into hunting Fark. Flint doesn't want to go along, but does so out of fear, an uncertainty that he could stand up to Double that would get him and Float killed. These cutscenes are odd. While they do have relevancy to the mostly backseat story of this game, I mean, free guesses who the Guardian is, they mostly work to strengthen the events of 2, and they do it surprisingly well. The former game lacked the presentation to make its emotional beats land cleanly, ironically or otherwise. While I appreciate the SA2 style cheese, that game works because it's stilted. I mean, stilted. Spark 2 was just stiff, with often cumbersome writing, often feeling like a lot was left unsaid for intended dramatic effect, which failed to take effect. These new bits of backstory are the opposite. They improve what came before and are interesting on their own. The images are much better at conveying characterization and emotion. Their crude look and the fuzziness of the CRT give them a melancholy quality. They're like fading memories. Meanwhile, the limited presentation allows simple tricks like music cuts and distortion to have maximum impact in selling strong mood swings. This is all set to new contributor R. Free's track, A Boy and a Girl, which is a bit of a blunt force instrument, but one that I like. It's a gloomy track which keeps in mind even during moments of happiness that all of this is headed towards a tragic end, and this goes along with how it ties in Fark's theme as a motif. Despite never appearing, he's what runs in the background of all this backstory, the terminal destination for many of these characters. There's also a recurring theme of discovering one's own purpose shared in these stories, typically symbolized by a character taking or receiving their name around the time they come to find their reason to exist, quickly followed by that purpose being stolen or corrupted, along with a nice big helping of self-doubt. A theme which Spark and Fark's arcs also arc along in their own ways. That seems to be the central thrust of this trilogy. I think it's more to lend the world texture than any big thematic message about destiny or what have you. At least if there is one, I can't work it out and that might be on me. Though on that note, the writing has improved, no longer clumsily evasive. It uses the framing device to tell us all we need to know about these characters without just falling to flat exposition. It's a well put together TV package. Meanwhile, Spark's story in the here and now is the exact opposite. No text boxes and minimal dialogue. Instead, we have very expressive animation delivering a charming mix of action and comedy. There aren't too many of these scenes, but they're a treat when they pop up. The contrast is great at showing us both sides of the setting. One, the grim reality that Spark 2 presented, and the other, the simple and exciting world in which Spark imagines himself. There's a nice little dash of dark humor sitting in that division. The overall approach does have issues. The story is given in odd, ill-paced bursts, and how often this series needs to work backwards does not inspire confidence. I mean, Spark 1's story had to be gutted so 2 could work, and now this one has to put in overtime because it didn't. Despite having more story than 1 and 2, I actually thought 3 had an incredibly minimal plot because without thinking about it, I discounted these snippets. It's easy for them to feel out of place unless you take the series as a whole, which ironically, despite my last complaint, isn't something Spark naturally leads you to do. And now I'm curious if that means I got japed. Because that's exactly how Spark was acting. The next two stages go great together, highlighting many of the same strengths, rediscovered from after the sequel and Spark 1, now translated into 3D and better than ever. Protest Prison is a jailhouse in the jungle, and would you believe it's taking inspiration from an even worse game than Heroes? This level is an inversion of Prison Island from Shadow the Hedgehog, reversing the overgrown prison theme into a detention center deep in the woods. The music makes the inspiration even clearer.
Meanwhile, Protest City is every single city stage from the Sonic series smoothed into quick succession with its own theme and flourishes layered on top. But it's not just the Sonic pulls pulling them together. To start with, it's how these titles wordlessly tell us part of the story in the world in ways which not only match but exceed the earlier 2D titles. In Protest Prison, we see locked up formies, and in the guts of the facility, we platform over assembly lines putting their cells together. Protest City, meanwhile, shows us where all these prisoners are coming from, and they are one of the funniest stage gimmicks I've ever seen. The crowds are giant bounce pads which spark and crowd surf. This stage is a riot. I love diegetic obstacles like these, connecting the setting, story, and gameplay together while giving us a sense of how the Fark Force is operating. And it's funny how you can look at all of this and go, yeah, I can see how Spark's getting the wrong idea here. Overall, there's so much extra decoration stage to stage, all made to fit the environment, like the Mega Dre terraformers in Drynian Desert, and the background buildings even being similar to the ones in the Moray Desert. This extra decoration even came into play from time to time, occasionally saving me from a nasty fall. Even repeat hazards like lasers are reworked to be appropriate in certain stages, like here they're electric grids. That flat, repetitive feeling stage to stage is gone. Areas here set themselves apart with unique rhythms, set pieces, decoration, and of course, gimmicks. Protest Prison makes use of zip lines in this weird rotating pulley thing. The zips are great because they carry speed onto and off of the rail. I wish the pulley did as well. It is fun, but sticks out by being as slow as it is. Granted, if you're tenacious enough, you can ignore it. You can use all the tree trunks to Tarzan your way across the level. Stages also evolve as they go along. The second half of Protest Prison sets the stage on fire. Good for clearing brush and bugs alike. Meanwhile, the deeper Spark heads into the city, the more resistance from the Fark Force ramps up. This is something even Sonic titles struggle with. Their levels often feel like semi-repetitive obstacle courses until maybe a sudden set piece to signal the end is coming. Levels in this game are really great at evolving as they go, giving a sense of progression, keeping the excitement high, and often escalating the difficulty, ending every stage with a true climax. And on that note, Protest City ends with a shoot 'em up section, as we nick one of the Fark Force patrol cars and turn it to our advantage. This is such a neat diversion. One really funny coincidence here, Shortly before I picked this game up, I had played Sonic Omens, a really rough 3D Sonic fan game with a pretty controversial development. It had a section just like this, only with sluggish controls and atrocious signposting. It serves as a reminder of how even a seemingly simple gameplay change can go horribly wrong. It made me appreciate how smooth an experience this was, and how careful Spark 3 goes about using it. For all of the work this feature must have demanded to get it right, it takes up less than 10 minutes of total playtime between this and an optional bonus stage. I'm gonna stop and just nail in that besides the music and soliciting help for two or three character designs, this is one bloke's second 3D release, coming just three years after the first. Sorry if I'm a broken record at this point, but the fact this game ain't breaking records is a tragedy to me. These stages are fully featured, flow and escalate terrifically, the art has gone from abstract to completely selling these interesting, detailed, and varied locations, and they hit a mixture of offering player freedom at speed without making all stages feel the same. It was Protest City that made me interested in getting all the speed medals. Its sense of flow and maybe the connection to Speed Highway made me want to hit those times. And I was hooked. It's a big part of why I attempted them when I replayed 2 for the video and gave me something to really appreciate about that game. And having now speed medaled every stage, Protest City remains my favourite to run. First off, it just looks great in motion. And I love how it's faster to dodge boosters and rocket over crowds. It's like I'm protesting the level itself. Speed medals are a lot easier than in 2. It's no longer about figuring out some arcane route and doing it perfectly. These times are a lot more forgiving, and generally only require a very well done execution of the main path with enough slack for a small mistake or two. I've been covering this game mostly from a perspective of how fun it is to go fast, but that's because it's how I naturally play these games. I'd sometimes just get diamond medals by accident, which was a hell of a confidence boost. Score medals, however, are exactly what I feared they would be last game. The time penalty is gone, and with the size of the stages, I can understand letting go of the mechanic, but that means there's no tension to them whatsoever. You just gather up points until you have enough. I will say that while Spark 3 may have lowered the skill ceiling a bit, it has also raised the floor. A casual playthrough now has actual friction, so I don't need to go after the medals for me to feel like the game had a meaningful challenge, it just provides one naturally. So all the score medals are tedious, I can live with that, I'm just never gonna go and get them again. 
The speed medals may be less complex, but they also challenge speed through the level as presented, not some arcane hidden level somewhere within there. It's a fairer task overall. I didn't need to get all the medals in this game, there's no reward for it. I just did it because I wanted to. If I have any complaints, it's with the UI and how levels work. In the last game, the times would be listed on the world map for quick reference. Now you have to go into stages to see them. Plus the levels and bosses used to be separated and you would have an option to disable cutscenes. Now no such choice exists, and every time you replay a stage which has a cutscene or a boss after it, it will play. It's not the end of the world, but it is an inconvenience which didn't used to be there. On to the boss. We spot the Mega Arrester and give chase. Yeah, we keep the car for this, which is a fun gimmick for a boss. Nothing more challenging than what we faced in the stage, but a memorable mix-up. Look out below! Oh, look out the side window! I love the flailing car animation. A SWAT bot squares up for a fight and... Hey, who's this? What follows is a simple fight. The SWAT bot has few moves, all of them slow, and mostly just calls in for reinforcements. This is all a well-played bit of misdirection, with Spark even absent from the results screen. So where was our boy? He was off getting a burg. Alright, back to the burg. Can we just let this guy have his bloody dinner? The subtitles tell us this is Float, and now there's alarm bells blaring louder than the police sirens, which of course Spark is deaf to. That's the breast foreshadowing so far. <laughs> she says she wants Fort Fark, and knows we're having problems with a certain soldier of his. And it's true. I can't get my juggles as stylish as I want them. She says she knows where Fark is hiding and will lead us right to him. When Spark asks what's the catch, she explains that that soldier is a friend of hers, corrupted by the Force. After that, she says she's coming along, no matter what. And with that, we have another playable character. The girl who died last game. No subtle foreshadowing when Float's around. I suppose you could call Float an easy mode of sorts. As her name suggests, she gets a floatier jump, akin to the wind power from the first game. Combat-wise, she has less combos than Spark and is much weaker at crowd control, but makes up for it with fast single damage attacks. Not to mention, just having her equip grants the face mark, meaning random enemies will be highlighted to receive bonus damage and get sent skyward. So even if you don't really use Float, it can be worth trading an ability slot just for the extra oomph. The next two stages are unique. We have outran the Blue Blur. No more levels inspired directly by Sonic for the rest of the game. And Spark does not suffer for it, because we're in for some really novel takes on level structure for a Sonic-like. Historia Hysteria is hard to explain, but I'll sum up by saying that it's just showing off. It's some kind of non-Euclidean science museum. I think. What are you doing up there? You loop through the same environment several times over as the stage flips, twists, and distorts. These repetitions connected by gorgeous railways and impossible spaces. At the end you exit out into a mirror image of where the stage began. It's hypnotizing. This stage wowed me from start to... start. Meanwhile Stratoria Interstellar is the exact opposite, yet no less impressive. Almost like the level design equivalent of a location study. In this case, an airport. Spark speeds through check-in, duty-free, baggage, and eventually out onto the tarmac before tackling the plane itself. Each area distinct, yet clearly of the same space. Recognizable elements of an airport exaggerated into brilliant yet coherent obstacles. If you've ever had a bad experience at an airport, it is so cathartic to absolutely tear through this one. Remember, no rushing. It's so crazy to go from 2, which had abstract environments by limitation, to stages which use abstraction for effect. To taking something as standard as an airport and making it flow so well. They're both relatively straightforward in play and feel more like environmental experiments, but I was more than happy to be subject to both. One thing that does unite these stages is they're both scored by Tud a new addition to the music team. Both tracks fantastic, both distinct, but both of a similar genre. I will say, every game I've covered today has had fantastic songs and Spark Free is in no way an exception, but there have been noteworthy changes. 
The only original member of the music crew still contributing new tracks is Paul Bevers. Unlike the prior games which split the workload over a group of six or seven people, Bevers and Tud supply a majority of the music, with minor contributions from a handful of other new faces. This does sadly mean there has been a major hit to the variety of genres on offer. With few exceptions, Bevers supplies mostly rock anthems with clear sonic influences, which are tied mostly to levels which derive from that series. Meanwhile, Tud is a lot more electronic. His music is a great fit for the more esoteric stages, matching the mystery of Historia Hysteria and the speed of Stratoria. It's a good sound for Spark besides. I mean, electronic music. The connection's pretty obvious. But we no longer have any of Funk Fiction's funk. Jazz has been totally excised, and there's no new Crush 40 style contributions from Andy Tunstall, nor Falk's more wide ranging genre inspirations. I'm not holding anyone to blame for this. They've all got a lot more profiles since starting on the series and busier schedules nowadays. This is a result of them getting just reward for their work. There are a few annoyances I do have. Only the first two areas have separate tracks for the bonus levels. Terminal Village has a remix which is great for time challenges. Rhinian Desert, meanwhile, has the one-level track composed by Leilani Wilson, the composer for Freedom Planet. That's just such a fun connection after all these years. The game could have done with more tracks like this. I love the music, but it's now all of a similar high tempo. Variety like this helps a stage to stand out more, and it's a beautiful track besides. Though perhaps the strangest thing is that a side level track was composed for Stratoria, but is either incomplete or just not implemented, but it does exist on R3's demo reel and sounds really good. This isn't a damning condemnation, but if I had to point out any way in which Spark Free is the weakest of its series, it is in the music. From another perspective you could call this more focused, but I really enjoyed the prior diversity and all the benefits it brought. These two areas do also give the game some cool boss variety. Historia capitalizes on its weirdness to throw Spark into a really bizarre boss fight. The throwback fight has us throw down against three bosses, cycling through them one by one. Double, EJ, and Rhino Dino, all of them modified to work with the updated combat. It's a really tough battle, the only one to have health pickups. And fittingly enough considering what we just talked about, it's an opportunity to hear Spark 2's boss music in an arena where it will actually play for longer than 30 seconds. Meanwhile, after catching their flight, Spark and Float are hanging out by the hangars. This game's awesome, it just never rests on its laurels. It has a mech battle. It plays slower and simpler in a way which sells the weight and scale of these machines. The parry is swapped out for a dodge mechanic which further sets it apart. But hey, unlike most mecha, this one's about the characters. That's just such a cool little animation. Float jumps to Spark's defense, begging Flint to recognize her and come back into the fold, but he looks away in disgust. 
berates Spark for his short-sightedness and warns that he's under orders not to kill him, but if he presses on, he'll be left with no choice. This scene is really solid, and it's followed by Flint and Float's flashback to really drill in just how bad these two get it. It's so much better at communicating interest and characterization without being explicit. Just the little look away, the animations, does it so much stronger. And it works within the confines of Spark's story, as Spark doesn't question what Flint means at all by his words, but instead focuses on Float's story. The simpler, easier to understand tale of a lost friend. The story where Spark gets to remain the hero. We're now heading into the penultimate stage, the Deep Descent. A massive level, epic in scope. We have to work our way down into the Fark Forces HQ, set in a giant cavernous bunker, holding entire cities carved into its walls and jutted suspended from its ceilings. The game panics on loading this stage from its sheer size, and the diamond time is a whopping 7 minutes 45. Perhaps the strangest thing about this level, however, is the mechanic it's built around. One that's been here all along, Fall damage. This may seem at odds with a platformer, but trust me, it doesn't lead to a drop in quality. The game takes this newfound focus very seriously, even funneling the player through a tutorial before the penultimate stage. When falling, you're presented with a timer. If it goes red, you take damage on landing. If it runs out, you're dead before you hit the ground. Literally. You can use your free stored moves to reset the timer. Your double jump, dash, and charge dash. By putting a limitation on falling, it expands how levels can challenge, but throughout the game it's only really a danger if you earn it. Not too intrusive to be frustrating, but present enough to change up some things. It adds a bit of danger to drop dashing and some tension to jumps, and with Deep Descent being the second to last level, it has one opportunity to really explore this mechanic, and it does. In very odd fashion. The tutorial can be harder than the stage itself. Following the guided path on Deep Descent will always lead you to drops which supply safety nets absent from the tutorial, with only one or two descents nearing the end which omit them. What's playful about this is so many hazards aren't about hurting you, but hurtling you off the stage. In many other games getting hit by one of these would spell instant death, but here these falls are survivable, if extremely dicey. It's like the level is trying to trick you into realizing how far you can fall. Speedrunning this stage is about learning that and stretching that drop timer as far as it can go, which is a terrifying feat of timing. You skip massive chunks of level by literally dropping by. It's a neat stage, and much like Planetary Circuit, ties the story to a central mechanic. And while we're here, it's not like the main path is light. This is an exacting level filled to the brim with enemies. And by this point, even the weak foes susceptible to the Jester Dash and the Charge Shot are rocking shotguns and sniper rifles. You gotta move very fast, and there is very little ground separating you from uncertain death. Whether you speedrun it or go about it normally, it's a great challenge either way. And then, once you're done, no side stages, no bosses, just one final challenge. The Utopia Shelter. We open the final stage, and look at this. Is there anything more exciting than a final level asking, think you're hard enough? This game has its own pacing issues, but by doing this the finale is given room to breathe and escalate on its own. You start this, you need to set aside an hour or more. Because this is a pretty recent release, I'm going to give another spoiler warning here. While you can probably guess where the ending is going, a friend of mine even called it on stream and he was experiencing the game through me, I find this ending really fun. If I've sold you on Spark, you should experience this for yourself. The level ahead is contentious and the ending loses some people, but I absolutely love it. My final word for the people leaving will be this. Spark Free is probably my favorite 3D platformer of all time. I drunkenly tweeted calling it the best, because that's the kind of drunk tweet I make. Not gossip or anything interesting, just drunken exaggeration of how good a game is. To clarify, as should be obvious, I like Sonic-styled platformers, but Sonic has only ever given me a bit of what I want. The reason this is the best is that this ticks all of my boxes. So if this video has just sounded like a guy relentlessly gushing over a game that does have some issues and maybe overlooking what you would see as flaws, there you go. I'm the guy covering this game right now, and this game is practically made for me, so yeah, I love it.
For everyone who is sticking around, I have a lot of thoughts about this ending, and going through them in my usual format would get very jumbled up very quickly. So I'm going to do what smarter YouTubers often do, which is recap the whole thing and only hit on surface level evaluations. Then after we're done, go through all the deeper thoughts it inspired. Look at the length of what's ahead and know that I'm sorry. I'm sure those coming in blind did not expect this to end with a plot summary this long for a section which takes just one hour. When I started the Spark series, this isn't what I expected either. Spark and Float finally access the Fark Force shelter. Flint arrives and pushes us over the finish line. Good going there, champ. It is a little bit weak that we've had this same fight several times and this final form doesn't bring anything new to the table, besides maybe heightened aggression. He fights at a bitter end, but if you've been able to beat him beforehand, you've got this in the body bag. The lift takes us down to the start of Utopia Shelter proper. And as mentioned, this level is divisive. You love it or you loathe it. Unsurprisingly, I'm in the former camp. It's a marathon of a level which can run for half an hour or more. I consider myself good at Spark, and the best I've been able to cut this stage down to is 17 minutes. It has no medals of any kind. This is a level that is just focused on getting through alive. And it sounds like for many, that's challenge enough. Maybe more than challenge enough. As the opening screen warns, this stage tests every skill you've learned. This is not an empty threat. An odyssey of a journey of a trek of a level, starting on the outskirts of Fark's underground techno city. I love this first little road. It's so oddly mundane as to feel out of place. I love there are distinct adverts down here. Like, oh, Mega Dre. I guess they dug the place out. And we got Fark for Soda, with the most unappealing tagline. Fresh as ever. Not too bad. I mean, has a robot to check. A distant tower dominates the background, and the city sprawls out beneath us as we scramble across a broken bridge to make our way over. This whole area gives me real Sonic OVA vibes, which is rad. Not to mention, it wastes no time pulling out all the stops. Robots everywhere, thin walkways, and it even throws tear gas into the mix to make the already precarious footholds even more uncertain. There's a moment of calm as we make it into the city. And hey, there's eerily similar signs in London. We finally make it to Fark Force Tower, and it turns out we haven't gone down far enough yet. This is where the stage changes. We continue our downward descent until eventually we're being told to take a flying leap into nothingness. And we come to here, wherever this is. These strange otherworldly challenge rooms start bridging our journey down deeper into the shelter, a series of precarious runways and combat encounters, joined by challenges of panic-inducing precision. Then, deep in the pit, we make it to yet another metropolis within the moon. Only this one is having problems. That mundane roadway at the start feels a world away from the trippy, otherworldly environment the stage devolves into. This whole thing is genuinely a trial. You need to have some baseline competence in every facet of play. Grinding, wall walking, combat, thin runways at speed, managing jumps, precision platforming. The level breaks down the player and reality goes right along with them. I love it. I love that it holds nothing back. This level tells a story of its own, preps the player for the ending, and is a great culmination of every mechanic. And after it's put you through the ringer, it starts wigging out a little. The last section takes that fatigue and then just lets you have a nice leisurely stroll through this totally empty, glitched out mega city. And as we finally reach the tower, we're still going down. Further and further down. Spark comes face to face with Fark, who's got a funky fresh form following in his father Freom's footsteps. Spark demands that he dissolve the Force, and he's thrown by the reply. Fark cryptically states he's lost count of how many times they've done this, and when Spark asks what's the catch, turns out, there's a pretty big one. Fark really, really needs a moment to explain.
After Freon's defeat, Fark went to Armstrong demanding to know about clarity. It turns out she's an AI whose purpose was to solve the unemployment crisis, alongside helping with policy decisions, with the ultimate goal being to protect and preserve life. To that end, she was fed with uncountable amounts of data, and at a certain point began to develop by herself, at a rate beyond what the scientists at Megarath could manage. Her smart virus spread her to every net-connected device. She not only had most robots under her control, but the means to create her own. Anyway, Armstrong's a little antsy saying it's already over, but Fark has a plan. We see him shake hands with the most rightfully concerned for me I've ever seen, and these three established the Fark Force. They cut off the net and settled in Utopia Shelter to insulate them from Clarity's influence. And it's there that Armstrong discovers her true intentions. Those in her thrall would receive a brain scan, their body would be discarded, and a copy of them uploaded to her virtual world. So, if you ever felt Soma was lacking loop-de-loops, this is the game for you. Things weren't looking good, and then Spark had to throw his jester hat into the ring. But it wasn't him who brought the world to ruin, it was who he brought along for the ride. Fark is the only unassimilated being left. Kind of. Per his design, Clarity can't peer into his mind, nor fully integrate him into the system. Spark, however... So yeah, bit of a gaff for a gaffer. We destroyed the world. Thousands of years ago. Then Clarity appears to make things clear. Congratulating Fark on gaining some control over her world. Not that it matters. She's off to go reset the thing. But first, she gives her son a very stern talking to. That this is a better world where people can live as they want. Just accept it. <laughs> this is not an image I expected to see when I got into this series. It then tries some meta crap I'm not fond of. How Spark has done this again and again, sometimes better, sometimes faster, reliving his best moments. Yeah, it's a framing device for how the game is played, but I don't like it. Luckily it gets out of doing this in Diamond Time and goes back to the fun stuff, hammering in how badly Spark messed up. Clarity says Fark should come to terms with his biggest mistake. And this causes Spark to short circuit. Fark. Desperate to keep control of the situation explains that over the years he's been able to peer into the simulation, work out how Clarity works, and siphon some of her power. But not being fully integrated, he can't use it. He needs to channel it into Spark so he can get them both out of there. And just as Spark comes to his senses, Clarity takes control. In a blast of light, Fark is returned to his base form. Control switches over to him as he fights to free Spark from Clarity's clutches. This battle is so exciting. It's a strong concept backed by awesome music. Fark has a unique moveset, regains his static mode from Spark 1, though much less overpowered, and this boss uses two of Freon's forms from the first title's campaign. It's a pretty clever way to reintegrate these. Not to mention, this fight is a monster. Three phases, all with tons of health, and you have to learn a new character. One better at single target damage, but who struggles with juggling. The battle ends against a corrupted form of Spark. This final phase is sadly not that interesting, mechanically. Almost a break after two far more aggressive and dynamic boss forms. I do sort of wish Spark played a bit more like EJ so we could have another rival fight. His moveset is fun in a thematic way, but lacking gameplay-wise. After the battle, we cut to black, Spark talking to himself in the void and slowly coming to terms with his situation. Coming to realize his real self likely died ages ago, and the severity of the situation, 
He does something he's never attempted before. He thinks, demanding to know everything he needs from the system. When he comes to, Fark puts together that Spark must have gained some control, and he must be able to get them out of there. Spark has a plan, but he'll need Fark's help. And then the dumbest thing ever happens. Good to see thousands of years haven't dulled Spark's ability to name things. Spark flies straight for clarity, central control, the means by which all the many clarities are synchronized. And the final boss is... pretty boring. Sparks isn't particularly fun to play. Jumping ahead a bit, it's hilarious how Lake seemingly got bored of doing the databases, so Sparks' move list more or less just says, I don't know, you figure it out. That's kinda lazy. And this boss blows because it's just a larger version of Linework Spark from the previous battle, which is thematically interesting. It's decent character work, but bad character action. This is the series' weakest final boss from a spectacle perspective. After Clarity's defeat, Fark comes to in a field of flowers, all alone. Spark is now in the system. He tells Fark that being in here means his personality will slowly be eroded, so he's going to release Fark into the real world and then shut everything down, effectively ending his own life. And Fark ain't satisfied with that. Some rad shonen kicks off as Fark is so pissed at Spark he becomes a real boy. Spark is pulled back to Earth, in a manner of speaking, and Fark berates him for giving up so easily. It's clear Spark was trying to run away, but he's not going to be let go that easy. They're both responsible for what went wrong. And so ends Spark Free. Perhaps the strangest, stupidest ending I've ever seen, and I love it. It's one of my favourites. Unironically adore it. Though the credits are a Friday night funking parody, so I do have to retract everything positive I've said about the game. And post-credit, we see Fark step out of stasis, endeavouring to reverse the effects of clarity and build a world of the free. And suddenly I've got a lot more questions, but they don't matter. The storytelling of the Spark series is... Kind of like watching a clown fall down the stairs. It's clumsy, it's baffling, but it's just so entertaining that you can't look away. You don't want to. For me, this ending is that clown landing at the bottom of the stairs feet first with cat-like tread. Arms out, big smile on his face. Looking for all the world like he meant to do that all along. I have a hard time believing he did. I saw him try to save himself repeatedly, but I really want to believe it because... I can't help but be impressed. I didn't feel that way when I was initially watching it. All throughout that experience, I had a nagging feeling at the back of my head that I shouldn't like this. That we're not just jumping the shark, 
we're about to start doing Super Mario Galaxy style orbits of the thing. Sure, it's a unique way to close out a game like this, but novelty alone isn't enough to make something worthwhile. I also plain didn't want Spark to have this unhappy ending. For whatever reason, I'd grown to care about this weird little electrical idiot ant and his happy-go-lucky stupidity to the point I just didn't want him to have this weird, sad, existential ending and wipe away this setting I liked so much in the first game and kinda in this one too. So I had my doubts, but I was pretty much won over by the end of it, and in rewatches and picking apart this ending, some meta aspects aside, I like it pretty much through and through. So with all that said, let's break down Spark's breakdown. This entire sequence is wonderfully directed, animated, and edited. The camera work, cuts, timing, and character work all bolster the mood it's trying to create. A wonderfully done mix of horror, drama, hype, and comedy. A hard mix for anyone to do well. Yet Alone Lake, who I will say, has a mixed track record when it comes to storytelling. Yet this ending lands it with aplomb. How? That last one, comedy, is especially important. Even when I was having my doubts about this ending, it was still getting genuine laughs out of me. Comedy is something that's very easy to mishandle with this much going on, but it felt so carefully measured. It didn't break the tension, just helpfully tugged on it, and let all of those other emotions flow so much more naturally. The chair teleport, Fark in a suit, Sparks. It's these goofy little moments which wink at the player and remind you that it knows what it's doing. This scene acknowledges the adult in me who knows this is silly, while still bringing out the child going, yeah, but it's cool anyway. It's trying to get those two to shake hands, and I hope Kid Me has a little hand buzzer to maybe spark some life into the older self's serious soul. And speaking of, one of the hypest moments is when Spark and Fark merge to create the ugliest looking entity in existence, even surpassing Armstrong. Actually, he doesn't exist anymore. And what's so great about this moment is the music. It's a callback to this scene from the first game. When these two first joined forces to win the day, this same music played. And just the music overall, it's a well-scored scene. Each time I get to that final moment between Fark and Spark, all of my ironic defenses are breached and I'm just smiling. Silly or not, I am fully invested in whatever comes next, if indeed anything does. So on the most surface yet arguably important level, I like this ending because it's relentlessly entertaining and endearing. It reminds me of those flash animations in Before and After. Even with their much lower production values, a talent was on display for expressing ideas without words. They demonstrated a solid sense of timing and emphasis. This is all those initial talents taken into 3D, with far greater ambition and polish. Some moments downright impress me and not even in a one-man band sense of the word. From a narrative perspective, I'm impressed by how it marries the tones of 1 and 2, while at the same time flipping everything on its head. This ending has a few reversals of circumstance I really enjoy. Up until this confrontation, everything here farkens back to the events of Spark 1, but with added elements from 2. Spark gets involved in a situation he doesn't understand. Fark tries to keep him out of the loop for personal reasons, ostensibly for his own good. Spark is confused by a robot girl before teaming up with them, and storming the villain's lair with their assistance. All the while, the supposed Big Bad sits on a throne, accumulating power which will be used in their world domination plans. This isn't all one-to-one, -one, but it is pretty close. Back then it worked out fine. Spark won the day. And while Fark's ego was bruised, it led to his journey of self-discovery. This time around, their short-sightedness blows up in their faces. I thoroughly enjoyed the game turning these flaws around on them, played for comedy up until the point the rug is pulled, only for the two to quickly confront those issues and turn it back around. This is also reinforced in the storytelling style. Turns out the lack of plot was actually a plot point. I'm gonna sound mad saying this, but I think this game may be slightly genius. For the reversals, this time we're not fighting a tyrant who wants to create a new world, Bark is trying to sneak us out from under one to get back to the real world, one which we inadvertently ruined. The dynamics in this scene are really solid, the way power figuratively and literally shifts between the characters with Spark as the pivot. In the first game he usurped Fark's role in a conflict he didn't understand. This time he hits a brick wall the moment he gets to Fark, and it's Fark who has to empower him to take back control. And hey, I said later titles would flesh this guy out. Fark is now his own person, the better yellow one who takes charge of the situation, meanwhile Spark is a not-so-carbon copy. The two then team up, hoping to lead the creation of a new world, something they fought against in their own games. I'm so fond of all this reincorporation. And while I'm not going to go full Yakuza thematic analysis on you, I do think that after stewing on this ending for far, 
far too long to distract myself from the boredom of editing audio. I have realized a common ending point for all of these characters, which ties into the whole purpose and names theme from earlier. That is, devoting yourself totally to a cause without all of the information will only lead to a bad end. It's a message that works comedically and stupidly seriously. Spark is a nickname, and the guy was so dedicated to getting his job back and mistrusting the one who took it that he was unwilling to examine anything more deeply because it got in the way of his anger, his selfish pursuit dressed up as altruism, and it doomed everyone around him. Spark wants Spark's happiness, but due to his own hang-ups about being his fake, keeps him at arm's length and denies himself an ally due to his own underdeveloped ego and desperate need to prove himself. And for that, he holds himself just as accountable for what went wrong. The boss squad, double aside because he was just like that, all met their ends through getting involved with his cause, none of them knowing all the details. This idea does fracture a little bit here because it wasn't really a lack of information, but an inability for them to act on what they did know that proved to be their undoing. Story is not the main concern of this series. What it has is one that's flawed but really fun to think about, almost because of its earnest flimsiness. I don't take this story as seriously as this video may portray, but my enjoyment of it and willingness to entertain ideas it creates is real. I want to be invested and see where it goes. Anyway, good going me with this insert, I've given myself more audio work to do. Maybe I'll crack more codes while doing this. That's the major stuff, but while Fark may be free, you're still watching this video, so I've got some more stuff I want to jam in. Yeah, the foreshadowing in this game is bizarre and likely very predictable if you've been paying attention, but to keep going on the theme of reincorporation, not only does Fark fight former Freon's forms, in both Utopia Shelter and Deep Descent, one of the obstacles are the Freon mind viruses from Fark's campaign. And that leaves you questioning, how could a robot mind virus attack an organic? Not to mention there's the whole deal with Float's face mark ability, that's a bit more foreshadowing, and Clarity's spaces in the Utopia Shelter, it's all a bit of a dead giveaway. It's really funny how this game just rubs it in your face that something here is wrong. It's even funnier that people who didn't play Spark 1 and 2 and came in on 3 would have gotten the most in-character experience. You would have just as much of a clue as this guy. One last thing about clarity, and this is pretty asinine and the point where even I know I'm going way too far for the funny ant hat game, but I enjoy this idea, so hear me out. I wonder if part of Clarity's corruption was access to human code, or at least human history. Historia Hysteria has an Earth exhibit. Clarity takes on the form of a small human doll. Freon took on a name which references old Earth culture. It's why the Ant Girl robot has knockers. And this one may be a stretch, but Clarity's theme is actually a reversed and modified lunar base from Spark 1, the stage where you go through an old human installation. Anyway, I can feel eyes rolling around the world, so let's move on. Simply put, this ending is a joy. A big, confusing, convoluted, bizarre, downright insane joy. Despite that, we're still not quite done, though I'll try and keep this brief. Months after the game's release, it received two free DLCs. The first was porting every level from Spark 2 forward into 3. And they are somewhat trickier, and I'd argue more interesting with this gameplay. Levels like Titanic Tower in particular are given a new dimension by the sheer terror of fall damage. Getting all of the medals for these was a nightmare. Despite Spark's lesser capabilities, and the stages not being made with many opportunities for his strengths, the times are often unchanged. Sometimes you get a few extra seconds allowance. Or, in the weirdest case, Hyper Athlete, the time is actually stricter. Meanwhile, the score medals are odd. They've been rebalanced, but in such a way where you often have to hoover up absolutely everything in the entire stage in a somewhat okay time to hit requirements. It's time consuming, stressful, and honestly not very enjoyable. I'd give doing this a miss unless you really want to 100% this game. Ignoring that, these stages are undeniably a good value add, and you don't need to own Spark 2 to access these, so if you don't care about the story whatsoever, there you go, it's all there for you. A second update followed shortly after. Now clearing Apocalypse Thruster unlocks the Endless Dive, the bloody, bloody palace. Can this game's combat hold up to a survival mode? Sort of. That's really it. It's fine. A challenge of mastery and demonstration that the combat does have some stuff going on. This party gets kinda crazy. Throwing the player at multiple bosses in a row, and then multiple bosses at the same time, then buffing them for good measure. Some of this is hell. But there is a goal. At floor 100, you face a massively buffed final boss. Getting to this point takes about an hour and a half, so do get comfortable. Ignore the timer. Unlike Spark, it runs slow. Beat that and the following wave of clarities, and upon returning to the world map, 
we get one last mysterious orb. It's him. Unit 1 is back, and this guy has legs. A demonic super boss. He has fast combos. He has Fox parry. He has some bastard attack strings. And you have to fight him twice in a row, with the other final boss as a buffer in between. Oh, and the stage rapidly drains your energy and combo meters. So no heals nor damage bonus for you. This is a battle of endurance and cards on the table. I did not endure. I had to cheese him with the Reaper. I suppose you could say I was scared to death. I eventually take him down, and we get one final cutscene. Claritas appears and reveals that all we've achieved is cutting off clarity from a central consciousness, but they're still numerous in number and in agreement. Something in Freon activates, and he jumps to Spark's defense. <laughs> This is Clarity's backup of Freon, a brain scan taken just before Fark's creation, which we learn a bit more about. Freon never truly trusted Clarity, so Fark was a backup, not just of his data, but a literal backup in case she was as dangerous as he suspected. And I'm sorry, but this is the third or fourth answer we've been given about Fark's revised origin story, and it's the first one where I immediately went, ah oh yeah, that makes sense. I've been left with more questions after every other attempt to explain why Fark was made. This one, at long last, is sensible. So, I suppose that's the last thing from Spark 2 fixed. This cutscene is interesting for me, but is pretty heavily expository, which I'm not sure how to take. This is essentially a new character, a side of Freon we've never seen, and a far more benevolent bucket of bolts. His plans in 1 and 2? He has no idea what he did. They were not part of his programming when he got put into the machine. And Spark 2 is a different character, more questioning and proactive. It's interesting to see where this might go if indeed it does in Spark 4, but it's a little bit sad to see that he's no longer quite as much of an idiot. But I guess that had to happen. Spark sets Freon loose in the simulation, not supplying him with all the answers and hoping he'll find his own. Much like Freon did for Fark. I literally just picked up on that. And unlike the original ending, this one ends with a promise. And you know I'm on board. And so concludes Spark Free, and the trilogy thus far. After an upset like that ending, I am very interested where we go next. But as of now, Lake is having another go around with XF, this time called Extreme Formula. It's looking the most developed take on the title so far, so this time, it may be the one. This video was made to chart the series, sure, but also the growth of its developer. It's a hell of a thing, starting with Sonic fan games in 2011, and in little over 10 years going from that to this making two games which have become personal favourites in their respective genres, leapfrogging his capabilities with each and every release. It's such an exciting thing to experience. This series is a brilliantly composed composite, which through iteration and remixing of all of these mechanics does become pretty much its own thing, outpacing many of the things that led to it. And a weird diversion, but I don't want to sound too down on Sonic with all of this. The funny thing is, while I do like Spark 3 a lot more than Frontiers, I think I like Frontiers more because Spark 3 gave me everything I ever wanted out of a Sonic game, and that let me appreciate Frontiers for what it was. The story is a mess that somehow finds a way to tidy itself up right at the end, in a way that skates on the edge of being a complete disaster but somehow completely avoids it. And it hardly matters anyway, because when it wants to be hype, it knows exactly how to nail that emotion. Writing this video has been an odd challenge. This series has brought me so much joy, and I've struggled to capture the why in my writing in a way that I'm happy with. 
But I hope I've kept you entertained. I hope I've given you an idea why I like these games so much. And I really, really hope you'll give these games a shot. This has been Tesnakera. Thanks for watching. If you want to support these videos, please spread them around. If you want to support them more directly, I have a Patreon. You can see all the lovely patrons scrolling by at a very high, very appropriate speed. Everyone gets thanked. At $3 you get access to my notes and script. I honestly think this has been my longest notes document so far, beating out Yakuza, which I only really write story notes for those anyway, otherwise I'd be gone even longer than I already am. At $5 you get access to afterthought videos where I answer follow-up questions and squeeze in any thoughts that didn't quite fit into the main video. The next project is Yakuza 6, and I hope after doing that to go back to some proper jank for a while and maybe get the next Sonic wrong and a pure Ronage video done. I've started and promised too many projects. It's nice to have plans, but I'm sorry for all those who are waiting for one thing or another. We'll get to them eventually, but that's all for today. Again, thank you very much.